Welcome to Norse Code, the number one podcast for your Minnesota Vikings. I am your host and producer. My name is James Pagoshnik. Thank you guys so much for listening. And at the other end of the tin cannon string, we have our analyst and co-host. You know him from numerous blogs and podcasts around the internet, most notably from theathletic.com. He is Mr. Useful Human, Arif Hassan. Arif, that was one hell of a Monday night game, and there's a uh, and any good Monday night game should have some sort of like a uh, conspiracy theory aspect to it. And I like this one. Oh yeah. Yeah. No, this one's good. Um, so the conspiracy is that he got an IV. <laughs> I like how that's the conspiracy part. Not, you know, yeah. that he had like left to go to the bathroom in the middle of the game. Just the, the, the actual conspiracy is the real, like reason, the, the, the official story. Uh, is the uh it's 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 clearly the the least believable version of the truth mm. just uh um, yeah okay well i mean okay so we should probably explain for like the uninitiated <laughs> what's going on here if they didn't uh if they, if they didn't catch the monday night game um which was that um Okay, so first of all, this game had like, what, five lead changes in the fourth quarter? It's one of the most exciting games I've ever seen. But what precipitated that was uh, Lamar Jackson being forced to leave the game sometime in, I think, the third quarter, and um, the the Browns being able to kind of use that opportunity to score, uh, go for two, and, um, and put themselves in a position to uh, tie up the game, which they ended up doing. And then there were a bunch of lead changes back and forth. So Lamar Jackson has to leave the game. Trace McSorley is playing. He is not a remarkably effective quarterback. Uh, and the reason that Lamar Jackson has to leave the game officially is because he's cramping. But we have decided based off of the way that he was walking to the locker room slash where the bathrooms are. And where the, and the anecdotes and tweets from his teammates and for, yeah anecdotes and tweets from his teammates including robert griffin the uh, third that he he was he was uh taking care of some other business that was a little bit more immediate he's pooping so this is uh this has been just an interesting game to to analyze and sports twitter lives for dumb moments like this oh absolutely yeah. this is this is this is sports twitter's time to shine as Arif's timeline will will show you from from this game, this is why sports Twitter exists is for dumb stuff like this. So it was a uh, it was a hell of a comeback, and uh, from a betting aspect, there was a fantastic backdoor cover there. Uh, but really, just that that was a really fun game to watch, and the fact that uh, Lamar Jackson immediately after the game said, "I didn't pull a, pal, a Paul Pierce here." I really did have cramps, and there's there there there's tweets out there with with images of of him with with the wrap up on his arm where he would have had the IV. Arif happens to think that this is just another part of the 4D chess. Yeah, a really smart move on their part to um, to 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 wrap his his non dominant arm with the with a bandage in order to kind of keep up the fiction. So yeah. Really, I just think that that's next level stuff. Your. Uh, your 16 part series on like a loose change version of this game (laughs) is going to be quite impressive. I look forward to, uh, (laughs) I look forward to seeing that. That'll be astonishing, especially featuring the, the number of tweets out here. Yeah. Everybody seemed to be going off of all people. Professor poop was, was, was pretty quiet during it though. That was kind of the, yeah, I, well, he had to, someone finally um, mentioned him in one of my threads, and and then he started uh, actually responding and stuff like that. So uh, he must not have been um, watching the game. Uh, and then and then as soon as he was informed of the situation, he uh, he he uh, he leveraged his expertise after that. Yeah. Well, I'm glad that he was able to. Uh, well, uh, weigh in uh, with his expertise because that is something that. The, the leading the leading man in this sort of research should should do. Welcome to this episode of Norse Code. Want to thank you guys so much for listening, and thank you guys so much for listening to the live show that we did last week. That was a hell of a lot of fun. Uh, we had a number of people come on to the call, and we did some pre-show stuff. There was a an interesting story that came out post uh, show that uh, the audio will never see the light of day, but it was fun to tell. Um, 
which has apparently upset a number of the people who were on the call and that missed it. So uh, apologies, but this is why you go to the live shows. Just uh, just yeah, saying. To, to hear stories that can't be retold. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> stories that can't be you know put out for the masses outside of the people who pay for the show. Uh, I have seen the lamp, by the way. It exists. Yes, I, I did, in fact, send a picture of that to, to a reef. So... Um, or one of them anyway. No, no, that was the original one. Never mind. So, yes, in any case, I want to thank you guys so much for uh, uh, for coming on, for, for listening to that. Uh, that was a heck of a lot of fun. Obviously, we'd like to be doing that in person. Uh, there was a suggestion to be doing a Zoom live show again next year. We'll see. We'll see what ends up happening. It's certainly not a terrible idea, and it was a heck of it was a heck of a lot of fun. So we may end up uh, considering that moving forward. But again, want to thank you guys so much for listening to this episode of Norse Code. If you enjoy the show, if you hear value in the content that we put out, you can support us in one of two different ways. You can go to patreon.com slash Norse Code, and you can donate uh, $3.50 per month. That will get you access to the bonus episodes. Uh, Tree Fitty does, in fact, keep the Loch Ness Monster at bay, uh, gives you the bonus episodes, bonus content, things like the Zoom call, things like the Zoom watch along that we're going to be doing at uh, for the last game of the year against the Lions. So if you would like access to that sort of silliness, you can do so over at patreon.com slash Norse code. Uh, you can also go to paypal.me slash Norse code as well if you'd like to just donate to a one-time donation there. Or norsecode.threadless.com over in the collections area. Just in time for Christmas, a ton of Norse code random items, including the logo on shirts, baby onesies, and whatnot. So if you want your baby looking as fly as humanly possible... Let's go with that. Uh, head over to norsecode.threadless.com <laughs> and, uh, and check it out. So, uh, again, want to thank you guys so much for listening. And uh, we have a new person on Patreon. Just want a quick mention. Uh, thank you to uh, Nicholas Blondell, who says, Decided to join after the brutal Bucks loss because I live in Maryland with a bunch of Washington fans and need parasocial relationships to make this Vikings fandom bearable. All right. Yeah, we can pretend to be your friends for sure. Absolutely. Uh, not a problem. That is definitely within our wheelhouse. I didn't know there were a bunch of Washington fans in the Washington area. Like, my understanding is that's kind of a uh, a bit of a dead zone <laughs> for, for fans. Of, <laughs> no, no. I mean, um, I mean, there's a lot of DC natives that that, that support the Washington football team. Um, it's just uh, Washington DC gets like this. Uh, fair or not fair, maybe fair reputation for being transient because it's, you know, the political town. So a bunch of people bring their their uh, local affiliations with them to Washington. But I mean, there's a bunch of people that just like live there to live there. Right. And so, um, yeah, they support the Washington team. But yeah, there's a ton of Washington fans or legacy fans from when it was like the team that was the furthest south in the NFL, uh, <laughs> except for like Texas. Right. Um, so there's that. But uh, yeah, no, there's it, it's kind of like a. a I imagine a fairly weird dynamic where uh, you've got a bunch of, of Baltimore Ravens fans uh, outside of that like exurb area and then a bunch of Washington fans there into the south. See, I always figured it was a combination of uh, the mixture of fan bases that just go into Washington and then Dan Snyder. And that combination would make it so there's just not a lot of, uh, you know, Washington we've seen fans. so we've seen so many fan bases endure bad ownership across the years across leagues and teams that I mean that doesn't like surprise me that like people were like you know this Dan Snyder thing this too shall pass yeah but it, we're talking about like a Hall of Fame level bad owner here like easily top like he and Donald Sterling end up getting in on like the on uh, on like the the first ballot sort of thing. Oh yeah, no, for sure. I just think that you know uh, we, we've seen fandom survive quite a bit, and bad ownership is just like uh, even even Hall of Fame level bad ownership. Yeah, you know, people will endure that. So I mean, they're I mean they're still Browns fans, right? After after these twenty years of of whatever, and that's got to be worse than having a bad owner. Plus, they also have a bad owner. Mm. I wonder where Red McCombs would end up going if he'd be like second, like second ballot. I, I yeah, if he'd stay. Yeah, uh, I, I, I don't know if he'd be like a second ballot, but I think that he would probably make it after a couple of, uh, of finalist appearances in the Hall of Fame balloting process. 
someone from the strip would end up doing a, a nice uh, puff piece on how terrible yeah, an owner right. he was in order to get into the Hall of Fame. Yeah, no, you got to do the media work for sure. Yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> and then he ends up saying he's not going to go unless they move it. So you just kind of you just kind of stuck there. All right, uh, let's go into whatever the hell that Bucks loss was. And there's a couple of things that I have learned as a sports fan over the years. And I want to share them with you if you haven't figured them out already. Uh, the first thing is if you are a fighter in the UFC, you never let the fight go to the judges. Never. Never, ever. And second, if you are – the only other thing I know for, for certain for, for sports is that if you are a Vikings fan or if you're, you're, if you're the Vikings, never put your faith in a kicker. It's never going to do you well. And unfortunately, that turned into the theme of this game. There were a lot of uh, different opportunities that the Vikings could have seized and could have capitalized on, but that's not what they were able to do. And I hate that we have to start off with kicker and then go to refs. I would rather not talk about either of these two things, quite frankly. But the first thing we have to talk about is Dan Bailey, because his misses not only left points, uh, you know, left points uh, that, that could have been capitalized, but it caused the Vikings to completely change their offensive uh, game plan when it came to being in the red zone. And they were having to trust Bailey and be burned by that. So let's talk about Dan Bailey first. He is still a member of the Vikings, despite his large number of misses. Uh, They haven't signed anyone yet. Let's, uh, let's give an update on that. Um, yeah, so they worked out uh, former AAF and Texas A&M kicker Taylor Bertolette, who was actually not that great in the AAF, but I think um, heading into that season of AAF football, people expected him to be the best kicker in the AAF. Um, so he must have had a, a strong enough college career to kind of warrant, I, I guess, that. I don't know. It's a very weird thing to be talking about, but I do remember that Bertolette was the kicker that everyone was talking about in the AAF. Um, but they do have a kicker on the practice squad that um, has not cleared COVID protocols yet. And so that's the person that would, um, if we saw a game day activation for someone else, uh, Tristan Vizcaino. Uh, I don't know if I'm pronouncing his name correctly. I have never heard of this person in my life. Uh, I'm Googling him right now as opposed to before the show when it probably would have made sense to uh, to do research on him. Um, but it uh, looks like he's formerly a member of the the Bengals? I don't know. Um, yeah, uh, Will Raggett's over at SI, uh, and Maven uh, wrote uh, a little bit about him. Uh, spent time with the Bengals and the Cowboys, never kicked in an NFL game, which we already knew. Um, and then uh, Raggett also lists Brett Maher, Adam Vinatieri, Chandler Cotanzaro, and, and Giorgio Tavecchio, former Raiders kicker, former Chiefs kicker, former Colts kicker. Uh, and former Cowboys kicker, as well as Stephen Hauschka, former Seahawks and Bills kicker. Um, I, I mean, like, the, the thing is, I mean, the, 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 the fundamental problem here is that there are, you know, 32 starting kickers, and then in addition to that, there's 30-odd kickers on practice squads, which we've never really had before. Like, I think in, you know, 2019, you could say there were probably 35 starting quality kickers, and if you weren't rostering one of them, then you could cut that guy and probably like pick up like Graham Gano or whatever, right? Um, and and just get kind of the last guy on the list that you know is going to make you like a solid eighty five percent of your field goals or whatever, right? Uh, and that's what you had. So if there were like thirty five possible kickers that might be able to do it, maybe in a particular year, and there were some reasonable odds that one or two teams wouldn't have that kicker on the roster, but by the end of the year unless they were like cap tied to them because they drafted him in the second round or something. Um, we're probably going to replace that guy with one of those, those veterans that was just kind of floating around like your Kai Forbaths, for example. Um, that is not the case this year. You know, kickers are on nearly every practice squad, if not every practice squad. And so um, that number is like negative 22 or something like that. You just don't have enough starting quality kickers out there. You might be able to kind of poach someone off of a practice squad, but if you do that, you have to find someone who's not uh, protected on a practice squad. This is why the Vikings kept protecting Chase McLaughlin. And you have to make sure um, that, you know, the the team that 
is not protecting their kicker is is like not doing so because they don't have confidence in the guy, right? Like you have to figure out that the practice squad kicker that you're sniping is like good at all because in order to sign someone from a practice squad, you have to sign him to your roster, which means cutting somebody, probably the kicker. And like I don't know how comfortable I am thinking um, that you know Kari Vedvik is a better kicker than Dan Bailey. Like I I would not think that even after having watched Dan Bailey do all of this. Um, so I don't know that there's like an easy solution available. I mean, this is kind of a year where, you know, this is impossible. Like teams normally did this because, um, a, it's a pretty, actually pretty good use of an extra practice squad spot, but B, um, any player can be added at any time because of COVID that's not the issue with the Vikings or trying to deal with a problem involving talent. Right. Um, and, and, and they just don't have that available to them. So, um, yeah, they, they have to kind of plumb the depths of the practice squad. And these kickers are just not good. Like, I, I don't know how else to put it. Um, is it a situation where, and, and obviously this is, just, this is just pure speculation, is this a situation of, of talent kind of going downhill? Or did the movement of where they do the extra point just, just, just this is it? Like, this was the, the one piece in Jenga that, that knocked everything down for kickers in this, uh, in this, uh, in this league. Like we've more, it seems like more kickers have yips now than ever have before. Um, I think some of it is like, uh, some, some of the talent retiring and moving out. But I, I think really after kind of the cavalcade of extra missed points that we had at the beginning of the new extra point rule after that, it, it's actually, I mean, kickers are still doing better. Like if you track, um, like, and this is kind of net, right? But if you track, uh, you know, field goals made by distance versus expected, like that has risen slowly, even into 2020. And and maybe it's kind of a difficult thing to say after the weekend that we had with so many missed kicks and extra points and stuff like that. Um, but for the most part, kickers have been fine. Um, it's just, uh, it's just like this year, um, the kicker of it, the ability to cycle through kickers is just so much harder. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's, it's, I don't think that there's any kind of lack of talent. If there is, it's probably kind of a small difference. Um, I, I just think that it's just more noticeable because teams can't replace the worst performing kickers as easily as they normally would. So, I mean, that's the problem. Um, I'm going through some other like practice squad guys. So Sam Sloman, I'd be interested in Mike Nugent, uh, on the Cardinals practice squad. I'd be interested in Austin McGinnis on the, Rams practice squad I'd be interested in. Um, that's about it. I guess Elliot Fry is on the Falcons practice squad. Not that interested. Um, not that interested in Kari Vedvik. I don't know who half of these people are, but Sam Sloman, I think I already mentioned. Um, yeah, that's about it. Um, but yeah, uh, the, there's like, um, it's, just, it's just so difficult to find a kicker because they've all been rostered at some point. Four missed kicks in the game. Is yeah, and he, and he finished the previous game right on a yep, missed kick. Sure did. Yeah. So so he he's on a run of missed kicks. Yeah. This uh, this was, this was points, yeah. if you missed the game, it, it it was as brutal as you can imagine. It started off with a it started off with a miss with with a missed extra point, and it only it 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 got comical after a while, and people had it tweeted out or said, you know, is this how the Vikings are gonna like? Why would you send him out the second or why would you send him out the third and the fourth time? It's like you 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 have to. That's the problem. Arif and I referenced this video from Bomani and Jones <laughs> like uh, eight million times. We, we've done yeah. it eight million times, but this is eight million and one. And the reason why we we why we reference it why why we reference it rather is because it's so valid. It's the person you hate the most on your team. It's the quarterback who has one problem dumb crap who just you know he's gonna have great games he's also gonna look like a total idiot but you pay him that much so you have to have him out there the number two corner (laughs) is your most hated person (laughs) on the defense and you got that kicker and you have to bring him out there because you make a 45 yard field goal (laughs) you you gotta do that it's the thing where you're you're paying Dan Bailey money. He just correct me if I'm wrong, but he just got an extension too. Like he just got he just got more money. You pay him this much because he's going to be used. 
And when you do something stupid and knock yourself back from uh, what was it like, you know, first and goal or whatever, second and goal, when you find yourself in a situation of fourth and, you know, fourth and 25 or whatever for, for for, like for fourth and goal, you have to kick. You don't have another option. Right. Like I, I understand like after, you know, after this like run of field goals, if the Vikings score a touchdown again, which, uh, okay, sure. Um, they, they did do that. Um, you, you go for two, which fine. But uh, which they did, right? Uh, if I'm remembering correctly, <laughs> they did. Um, yes. And but that was uh, actually at the time. There's also just as much the math of the situation. But yeah, okay, you go for two. But um, fourth and fifteen from the 36. It's a 54 yard, a 54 yard field goal. Um, they just took um, a false start and a sack or something like that to get to to get to the 15. Um, and that's an incomplete. Uh, and then then third and 15 was an incomplete to George, uh, Justin Jefferson. Um, yeah, I mean, it makes sense at that point to kick that field goal from the 54, uh, from the 54 yard mark, because a punt there gives you, if you don't have a touchback, a touchback only gives you 16 yards of field position. That's insane. Um, you can't go for it cause it's fourth and 15. I mean, you can, but that's a desperate, uh, you're almost certainly not going to make it. Um, I, I think the odds of that field goal at that moment, right, of the 54-yard field goal at that moment after he misses one extra point and one field goal, you line him out there for 54-yard field goal. I think at that moment the odds, the way that you approach that is you think those odds are better, right? Because two missed kicks in a game, that happens to kickers, right? And, yeah, he missed a kick in the previous game. But, you know, three missed kicks in the past, uh, you know, two games, that happens to kickers and they still make their other kicks. Like that has occurred before we've seen you know vikings kickers it's happened it. to bailey Lyme, before but, yeah it's happened to bailey before in fact in 2017 he's had this happen um where he missed a, a number of uh, extra points and field goals all in a, a very short time span um and then and then he makes every kick from uh, you know zimmer said like from like some moment like september 2019 to october 2020 or something like that um and and you kind of just say well yeah i mean the odds are are that he makes that field goal are higher than the odds of converting fourth and 15 and are better than like the actual functional usefulness of like 16 yards of field position. If, if it's a touchback or 30 yards of field position, if it's a really good punt. So I get that. And then you have to line them up for like the, the next field goal, which was a 46 yarder and that was fourth and 28. Right. And that's the pair of sacks, right. Where cousins is incomplete on first and eight of, you know, at the eight yard line, then he gets sacked for eight yards, courtesy of Antoine Winfield. Then he gets sacked another eight yards, Shaquille Barrett. And then it's fourth and 28. Are you going to go for it on fourth and 28? Like, you can't punt. That doesn't even make sense. Like <laughs> Punting it, on a fourth and goal is not something. <laughs> that, that, bra- that might actually break the surrender index. Th- yeah, that's just wild, right? And so... Uh, you know, in that situation, I think you have to line up the, like, I don't think there's another option and you just have to say, Hey, this guy's a veteran. He's missed kicks before he's gotten himself out of, you know, the, that mental kind of prison, right. Of, of constantly missing kicks and, and not being there. He's done it before. I'm going to have to trust him to do it again. Um, I don't even think it's like, a, a, a situation where it's like, well, we're paying the guy to do his job. So might as well do it. Right. Because you, you, like your job is not to make sure that everyone earns their salary. Your job is to make sure you win a game, right? Um, and so, f- from that framework, it, it doesn't really matter how much he's getting paid. Um, and more, just what do I think is more likely? You know, that we're going to convert a fourth and twenty-eight, um, or that we're going to get more than three yards of field position on a punt, and that's going to be worth anything, or that this guy who's like a ninety percent field goal kicker for his career is going to make this forty-six yard field goal, even though he just missed a couple. Like, I think that you probably go with the 46 yard field goal. And I know that that, like, that, especially as Vikings fans who've been snake bitten by, by field goals and, and just kickers in general, that that's like a, just a tough proposition because you know it's a kick that matters. So, of course, he's going to miss it. But I mean, he's made a couple of kicks that mattered this year from 46 yards specifically. So, I, I think you have to kick the field goals that, that Zimmer ends up deciding to kick. I don't think that that part of the game was managed very poorly. There are other parts of the game that were managed extremely poorly, but that part of the game, I don't think was managed poorly at all. This was a winnable game. And that it it, it seems like an odd thing to say, 
uh, you were especially down on the, I, I want to say, I don't want to say especially down, but you had said in the preview for the last episode that there's a real good chance that the Bucks were going to be able to go out of their buy and fix their problems so that, you know, say Tom Brady isn't overthrowing everyone by a week and a half and all and, and, and different things. And this was a winnable game. And a number of factors contributed to it not being a winnable game, uh, Dan Bailey being a very important part of it. Before we even talk about the play of anyone on offense or defense, I want to talk about the refing because there were a number of plays that were questionable, a number of plays that if they were called on any, it, it, you, it makes you wonder if they, if they like would be called on any other team. Uh, and there, something happened for the first time in either 10 or 20 years. I can't remember which, where a PI where a PI was called on a hail Mary throw, a hail yeah, so Mary PI. I, I think, um, uh, a lot, like it depends on how you define the variables, but like 30 plus yards out with five seconds left and it's a throw. Um, I think within that parameter with like five seconds left, uh, PI has never been called. I want to say, but the best our database can go back to apparently, I guess is 96. Um, there have been other situations where Hail Mary PIs have been called. I think 2008, uh, you know, there was one instance where, where a PI was called on a Hail Mary, but it didn't fit, um, the last five seconds. It must've been, um, it must've been, you know, the last 10 seconds or something like that. Um, but yeah, I, it's, yeah, so the, part of the thing is, like, I, I I am actually, for some of the calls that fans are upset about, I'm actually a little bit less upset about. Like, I think the the PI in the end zone where it was, uh, was that Gladney who got a, who got Mike Evans' helmet? Or uh, I, I guess it depends on whether or not you think he got his helmet. But the one where the, uh, the, uh, the pylon angle didn't show PI, do you, do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Yeah. That one, I think it actually made sense to call PI because I think that pylon angle doesn't show um, the actual contact from the from the defensive back, um, which is why I thought it was like not necessarily in good faith to just tweet that one out. But I, I think that the broadcast angle does show um, that even though Mike Evans is going to the ground of his own accord, that's not where I think the PI is. I think that putting your helmet on his or putting your hand on his helmet and appearing to kind of move his helmet. Uh, that's going to get called PI um, and it's minimal contact and it sucks. What can you do about it? But I think that that was fine, but I think the PI on the Hail Mary was wild. Um, I think the helmet to helmet on Harrison Smith, which um, I think that that even led to the PI in the first place, right? Like we wouldn't even be discussing the PI if it wasn't for that helmet to helmet. Um, that uh, was a nuts call. I thought that that didn't make any sense at all. Um, those two, I think were, were, were a bigger issue than the PI in the end zone. I think there was another defensive pass interference too outside of the two that we're talking about. But um, I was actually like, okay, so th there's a bunch of 50-50 calls here, and I would say that the refs are calling some of these 50-50s, many of these 50-50s away from the Vikings, and so it can feel pretty bad, right? But, you know, I mean, it, that's just going to happen from game to game where uh, there's going to be a couple of 50-50 events and, and none of them go your way. But then I think, um, and so I wasn't really upset with the refs until about the end where you get that helmet to helmet where uh, the runner lowers their helmet and, and Harrison Smith gets called for it. And then the PI on a Hail Mary, which I've just like never seen before. Um, which, I mean, I guess statistically, we haven't really seen um, very much or very often before. Statistically, no one has seen that. Right. Yeah. I mean, well, I mean, I guess, I guess if, if that game in 2008 that I can't remember that someone pulled up, um, if that counts, sure. I mean, I didn't, I didn't actually click on the link of the, of the game recap. So you know, maybe <laughs> that wasn't even a Hail Mary. No, so I don't know, but I, like, I'm convinced that was between two teams that have since folded, uh, from the league. <laughs> the league has also burned the evidence of that tape or just lost it to the, um, I mean, whatever it is, it hasn't happened in 20 years, exactly. right? Like, w regardless of whether or not that one game in 1998 or 2008 or whatever, you know, whether or not that's happened before, um, we haven't seen it for for probably two decades. And if, if there's a 2008 game, then I guess 10 years and some change. But it's like just not 
how that play is called. I, absurd. And then, like, what's even like what's even worse about that is that that wasn't even really pi. <laughs> it's like, like if you wanted to call holding on Todd Davis early in the in the down, that would have made more sense. But that's holding, which is not a spot foul, right? Um, if you call pi, you have to indicate that the defender is interfering with the catch process, which I don't really think there's really good evidence of like Davis's hands are completely, which you can commit PI without just your hands, but like Davis's hands are completely outside of of anything Gronkowski is doing. And the closest thing to PI is like, he's making contact with him with forward momentum as Gronkowski has stopped, which we actually saw in, in the Browns Ravens game was called PI. And I think correctly. So, but didn't really interfere with the catch process. So like, I, I don't like, it wasn't even PI, but even if it was, it's like, it's a hail Mary. So just a remarkably poor call. Yeah. So yeah, the, the Dan Bailey changes things. The refs change things. If you have a league average kicker and league average refing, the Vikings probably win this game. Um, and I say probably just because you have to, you, you don't know for sure, but I, a very, very high likelihood in my opinion that the Vikings win this game. So, um, yeah, I mean, and yeah, I mean, obviously, you know, other players could have played better, and and you don't want to take away from the fact that you know the Vikings didn't play you know so overwhelmingly well that they didn't let you know the game get out of the hands of the refs and the kickers. It was just incredibly upsetting to watch, and you know, dem- it was a bit demoralizing. Between that and the the missed kicks, it was just a very difficult game for the Vikings to, 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 to watch the Vikings play, especially since it seems like three weeks ago, the league made a rule that said the Vikings can't play in any normal games for the rest of the year. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, it's, uh, that's exactly what it seems like. Just, and, and like sometimes like abnormal games are like fun and exciting. Like, Oh, there's a great fourth quarter comeback. Oh, holy crap. That's fantastic. Uh, the game we just watched absolutely not normal at all in any sense of the word. But a great game to watch. And but these games are like pulling teeth, man. These games suck. Yeah. This is if you were ever wondering what it was like to be the biblical character Job as a sports fan, uh good l- uh, welcome to the 2020 Viking season. A season of possible hope. Uh this is this has been difficult and and it hasn't been just the kicker and it just and it wasn't just a situation with the, with the refs, this, it, it seemed like the Vikings had the Bucks number in, in, a, in a couple of different ways. And Tom Brady, especially in the beginning was not playing well. And the Vikings were capitalizing on it. Like this was not a game that was completely out of hand. Let's talk about the Vikings offense for a moment and their decision to prove that you could, in fact, run on the Bucks. Yeah, the Vikings definitely uh, you know, were able to prove that they were able to rush on the Bucks. So the Bucks entering this game had the league's best rushing defense by whatever metric you want to use. So um, a simple counting metric, like total rushing yards given up, which is not you know, a great metric, but they're number one in that. In expected points allowed total, uh, number one in that. In expected points allowed per play, number one in that. Yards per carry per play, success rate. Uh, against the run they were number one in whatever metric you want to use to define the run but the vikings um, not only had the single best individual rushing performance with dalvin cook who had 102 yards 65 of which were after contact um, but they had the best total rushing performance 162 yards that the bucks had given up all season um, and that's 97 yards after contact uh, some of that obviously Kirk Cousins scrambling you wouldn't really bin that in the in the rushing defense sort of thing but um Cook did a, a pretty decent job, 4.6 yards per carry, um, which, again, is is much higher than the Bucs have, have allowed for most of the year. Uh, and, and it's easy to kind of say, hey, there's these three runs that Cook had where he just kind of hit the dirt for no real reason um, or he got tripped up uh, when there was a, a ton of green in front of him. And it would have been nice because, you know, there's, there's an opportunity to just turn a 100-yard game into a 200-yard game, right? You would have been able to score a touchdown and have, instead of having to settle for, you know, a failed set of, of – individual goal line performances that go nowhere right um and and you would have had those touchdowns instead of you know turning those into missed field goals and and the vikings might have won um but i think that when you just kind of evaluate his performance i thought he individually did well it's just there's some uh, a bunch of yards left on the field those are pretty obvious and easy to to analyze but i think that for the most part his ability to generate 
additional yards after contact and kind of push through the pile and, and, and get some pretty decent runs off, you know, two, two runs of 10 plus yards. I think for the most part, he had a pretty good game. It just kind of sucks because there was a better game kind of waiting for the, for him there. Uh, and he didn't take advantage of it, but the blocking that was available for him as a run blocking unit, the Vikings did pretty well. Uh, it came at, it came at um, some, uh, like a sacrifice uh, in, in terms of pass protection, but as a run, as a run blocking unit, they did pretty well. There was a moment during the during the game when Cook lined up to run, and he burst through with with great speed. It was easily the fastest he ran from the line of sc- from uh, from from a spot all game, and he got just tripped up. Like one hand touched his ankle, and he ended up falling. And at that moment, it's like that was going to be it. And he like that was going to be like forward too. I think it was like Levante yep. David just grabbed him at the ankle, and yeah, he just flew yep, forward. Just got, yeah. just got like, got like his ring finger on him or something. Just barely grazed him and took him down. And it was like at that moment, it was like that was going to be a sixty yarder, wasn't it? Yeah. Damn it! That was going to be it. That was going to be the this this amazing. That was going to be the amazing run, and just just ended up getting stopped there. It was just ah, um. I mean, Vikings offense decided that it was important to target CJ Ham three or four times in a row uh, on a on a drive. That was interesting. Uh, not something you typically see of a team that wins, uh, but they decided to go for it anyway. Uh, I'm I am a big proponent of CJ Ham. I think he's a fantastic fullback, both as a blocker, an occasional pass catcher, and a uh, he, he's 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 a fat he's a fine person to have uh, for a name on the back of your jersey. However, <laughs> for a team for a team that has Adam Thielen and Justin Jefferson on it, I have to and let's and, and Dalvin Cook in the passing game as well. I really do have to wonder about the decision to do three or four plays in a row to CJ Ham. Yeah, no, it's so this is in the middle of a drive that we're going to talk about a little bit more as well. Um, but yeah, uh, so they, they pass to ham for eight yards from first and 10. Um, and then after that, they, they do actually have a, a Dalvin cook run, but it goes nowhere. So it's third and two, they pass it to CJ ham. Okay, fine. You convert it nine yards. That's fantastic. That's probably a good decision. Um, first and 10 at the Tampa Bay 40. Now you're in, I think a lot of people will call this the orange zone. Um, but you're in, you know, in a situation where you can't take negative yardage anymore because otherwise you're turning field goals into punts. So um, Rashad, uh, Hill goes in reports as eligible. So the Vikings were super heavy, right? They've got two running backs. They've got an extra offensive lineman out there and they run the ball. And I guess it like, it's, it's not a bad, it's like a five yard run, right? Like, okay. Uh, but they run the ball again with Davin cook four yards. And then you've got third and one and it's CJ ham up the middle. This time it doesn't work. He runs directly into Dominican Sue. It doesn't go anywhere, but the Vikings, of all the things the Vikings did really well, I would not have put converts every possible fourth down on the list, right? Like, that was nuts. I, I think we would talk about that a lot if they had won the game. Like, wow, they really came through when it counted. They were able to convert every fourth down opportunity that they tried to convert. Um, but uh, no, it doesn't matter. Anyway, Devin Cook, right tackle, one yard. They convert the fourth and one. Um, the, so the issue here is not that C.J. Ham was individually ineffective at what he was asked to do, aside from getting stuffed on third and one, like three of those four plays were probably net positives for the Vikings. A five yard run typically you'd say is, is a net positive on first and 10, eight yard run on first and 10, even better nine yard run on third and two, even better than that. But the issue is that the Vikings kept on finding ways to chew clock without getting a ton of yards out of it. So at this point, the Vikings are down. Uh, I want to say three scores. Like it was a 23 to six. So I guess, um, yeah, that's three scores. There's no way that you can. Um, so they're down 23 to six right after the Ronkowski touchdown. There's 10 minutes left in the third quarter, right? So you're not at a point where, uh, I think for a lot of people or a lot of teams, you think, all right, you know, we've got to, we've got to go into hurry up, right? Like you're not at the point where you have to be in hurry up, but the Vikings are in the opposite. They're in, they're in chew the clock mode. Right, so they've got a couple of incompletions on this drive, but they primarily are like running the ball, taking short completions, and just draining the like letting the clock get down to the to the to the zeros on the play clock. Uh, and so you're going from you know 10:05 left on the clock to the very next play is 9:26, the very next play is 8:43, to the very next play is 8:06. Like you're nearly taking 40 seconds off the clock each 
play. Uh, and some you are taking more than 40 seconds off the clock. Like they're just letting this clock run and they're not getting very many yards for it, um, which is how they're in so many third down situations, right? So uh, first down, second down, third down, first down, second down, third down, first down, second down, third down, fourth down, first down, second down, third down, penalty, third down again, fourth down, first down, first down again. Like you, you're taking so much time. The Vikings end up scoring a touchdown on this drive, but they take eight and a half minutes off the clock. So you, you started with 10 minutes left in the third quarter and you take all this time up off the clock. And now you're down with two scores. Like, okay, great. Like now, now we're basically at the top of the fourth quarter. There's one thirty left when the, when the Buccaneers get the ball back, you're basically at the top of the fourth. They have the ball. And they're up two scores. Like, what, what do you think is going to happen? Like, it was nice for the Vikings to essentially get a three and out um, on, on that following drive. But the Vikings have essentially two drives. If they were a more explosive offense on a more consistent basis, I would say maybe they've got more than two drives. But they've got two drives to score twice. That's their job. And that's what happens on this 830 clock. So uh, this reminds me again, I think two years ago against the Saints, I've brought this up a couple of times, but um, against the Saints, they took nine minutes off the clock at the top of the fourth, bottom of the third, when they were down three scores. And I asked Kirk Cousins about it. I was like, hey, did you maybe take too long to score there? And he's like, well, what did you want me to do? Well, score faster. That's obviously what I'm saying. Uh, and he's like, no, I, you know, I, I think the important thing is that we scored. And and I think this happens a lot. And it's not just with Cousins. I think it's with the Vikings. And and this is like a huge issue, relatively speaking. Like, of all the things that Mike Zimmer is good at are, are difficult to identify and quantify, but he turns out good teams, right? But the problem is when you get into these situations, if you've got a good enough team and you're Andy Reid, your clock management isn't going to matter. But, you know, I, the Vikings aren't there. Like, I think that if you took the 2017 defense and combined it with the 2020 offense, then, yeah, you've got, you know, a really great team where you probably don't have to worry about clock management all that often. You're probably in the playoffs, but that's not where you're at. Uh, and that's not where the Vikings have ever been at in the, in the Mike Zimmer era. Um, I, I think that very often when, when the Vikings have like 16 points to score, they only think of it as a two score game, which I think is dangerous because I think that, you know, you've only got a 25% chance to convert both of those, um, two point conversions. And yeah, the Vikings are just uh, extremely good at two point conversions, So maybe it's higher, but for the most part, I would not count that as, as a sure thing, even in the situation where you score, but, but they act as if they only need two possessions. And that's the problem. It's not that they count up the possessions probably incorrectly. And I think they do. It's that they act as if that incorrect count is now what they're going to do. And so they take eight and a half minutes off the clock they isolate themselves to what are essentially only two possessions left to score twice, force the defense to not give up any points, which, you know, they gave up three, but like credit to them. They actually did a pretty good job here. Um, but yeah, I, I, they don't give themselves any room like that. I, I say this all the time. The Vikings make it so hard for themselves all the time. All they do is make it hard for themselves because they've got a really talented offense that can be pretty effective, but they run a bunch on first down, they run a bunch on second and long, they run a bunch on second and short. They don't take advantage of a bunch of opportunities there. This year they're not doing play action as much. Sometimes it makes sense, sometimes it doesn't. Um, but on offense, it's just so difficult to get things done despite all this talent. And um, this drive is just such a good example of it. Yeah, they scored a touchdown, and you needed to score a touchdown, but... That's not like the goal isn't to accumulate points per drive, which I, you know, again, it's one of my favorite statistics, but the goal is to win. And that includes managing the clock well. And it doesn't just mean figuring out when to use timeouts or anything like that. Like that's important, right? And Zimmer's not great at managing timeouts, but the issue isn't that is that he's not coaching the team to think of situational football correctly. Like if, if Cousins says the exact same thing this week, which he did, as he did essentially against the Saints two years ago, where they also lost because they couldn't convert every single possible drive that they needed to convert um, after draining the clock, then he hasn't learned something, which is important. He needs to learn that. But also the team hasn't learned that they need to call a quicker offense because somebody was in my mention saying, hey, you know, why would you blame Cousins for this? You know, he's not the one 
that has to wait that that's calling in plays with 20 seconds left on the clock. Like, okay, I get what you're saying that Kubiak is calling in the play, then they huddle and then they, you know, there's 20 seconds left and the, and, and they're basically waiting for the mic cut off with 15 seconds left on the play clock. And, and he has to manage that. But like one cousins has to say on the sideline before the drive that they need to score quickly and he needs to assert himself Two, um, Kubiak's in the box. He can wave down. Like he can, he can point to the box and say that he needs the plays to come in quicker. Three, he's got you know the the wristband. He can call plays off of that. Like he can own the tempo. Like th- this is something where um, I think that if he goes off script to score quicker or something like that, I don't think he gets punished by the coaches or anything like that. Like my, maybe Zimmer gets like ornery, but like if you win, you win and nobody cares. Um, and and the, and the key here is that you want to be winning. You don't want to be pleasing your coaches in a loss. You want to be pissing them off in a win, right? Like that's ideal. And so um, I, I think that, yeah, I think Cousins needs to own it and find some way to get the team moving because it's him on the field. It's him controlling the tempo. And if the play comes in late, then who cares? Call a play. <laughs> like I, I like, yeah. Kubiak needs to bring if that's what's happening and the play is coming in late and Kubiak is is managing the clock about as well as 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 the Vikings want him to. Then yeah, I mean that sucks, right? But like, call a play then. Um, so yeah, they the way they manage this clock is is as if because it's a two score game, they're only going to ever need you know those two drives. And, uh, you know, they, they spend uh, a fair amount. So they get the ball essentially at the top of the fourth because they forced that three and out, which is great. Um, but uh, it's, was it first and 10 at the 47 at the top of the 15? Um, so they're, they're basically almost in Bucks territory. Uh, they scramble, short pass, short pass, run, run, uh, scramble, essentially. Um, and, and they're at the goal line at the, at the Minnesota 8. But it's a five-minute drive already. Um, longer than five minutes if you account for the fact that it technically it started on the 22, but they had a deep pass. But at the top of the 15, if it, they're at the 15-minute mark with the clock stopped, and they go all the way down to first and eight, and, and you've used 430. And it's like, well, okay, that's not catastrophic, right? If you run two two two-minute drills, right, then you've got some time to catch up and score. But I think for the most part, you should already be thinking about scoring faster at that point. And the Vikings are letting the clock, I mean, there's still 40 seconds between some of these plays, right? Like I understand why there would be 40 seconds between a, a play that, that took 25 yards, right? Like the Irv Smith pass right before it, but look a nine yard pass, but hurry up, get to the line, call a play. And they don't do that. Right. And then they call a run. And then there's 40 seconds between the end of the run and the, and the snap of the next play. And then there's 30 seconds between the end of that run and the snap of the next play. And then there's 40 seconds between that and then the next play. And yeah, I mean, then, then that's when the two sacks occur. Like, yeah, obviously if you execute at the goal line, you don't have to worry about this. Um, but that's, a, that's its own separate conversation. Like they just need to manage the clock better. And that's, that's a Zimmer thing. That's a coaching thing. You need to do a better job of, of teaching your team how to handle that situation. Um, but that's also, you know, to its own extent, a Cousins thing because he's got an opportunity to own the tempo and hurry up to the line and, and call different plays or run an offense quicker, and and he's not doing that, right? Like, yeah, if you have to mutiny with the coaches, dude, you're getting paid $30 million a year. You get to mutiny with the coaches sometimes. You get to go off script. Like, I don't know, like a... a I'm, like, I'm obviously, like, very kind of forgiving of of when I don't know what the nature of a relationship is. Um, between a quarterback and a coach and kind of who gets allowed to do what. And I just don't know. And I'm just going to say, I don't know. Um, and I usually don't like to just tell players to just be better. Right. Because I, I have no idea kind of what the context is, but here I think cousins just has to own it. And, and this is a guy that, you know, I've both praised for his, his work in two minute drills in the past and have criticized his work in two minute drills in the past. It's not something where I just feel like I want to bag on cousins to bag on cousins. I think that, you know, we've got some good evidence this year that he's been clutch, right? You know, he's been able to overcome some of the stuff that we think has been an issue with him throughout his career, and especially in a Vikings uniform. You know, I, I think that he should be commended for how he's played in clutch situations, even in situations where the team didn't win. Um, and and here, it's it's kind of the opposite, where he just helped manage whoever is responsible for clock management in the third quarter. He and Zimmer and Kubiak helped manage just this, this slow drive. And so um, the Vikings get the ball back um, 
with uh, after after the Tampa Bay drive with um, with five minutes having not scored on the previous drive. So they didn't give themselves any leeway, and now they've only got five minutes to score twice um, because Tampa Bay, rightly so, took time off the clock. Uh, on their, they, they took like, it was a, it was a, they didn't, they ran like six plays and they took three minutes and 44 seconds off the clock, which feels like the Vikings would have done the same thing. Like why, why are they managing the clock the exact same way you would? That's ridiculous. Um, so you're down two scores. You get the ball back with five sixteen. The Vikings run a bunch of plays this time. They're running them faster, but it still takes them all the way up to the two minute warning and they don't score. And then the, the, they get the the Brady and the Bucks get the ball back and they kneel out the clock. So yeah, I mean, this was originally about CJ ham and kind of this weird inclusion in the offense. But the reason it's a problem is not because he wasn't successful. He was on three of his four plays and the fourth play they converted with a fourth of one run from Dalvin cook where, where CJ ham uh, was, was a key blocker. Great. Good job, dude. But like the issue is not that whether or not he was successful in his individual job at what he was asked to do. It's that you're running an offense like you're ahead. It was a bit odd, and the only thing I could think of while I was watching it happen was the idea, potentially, if this was successful, if you went eight and a half minutes straight against this defense, that maybe the defense would be tired for every other time that you were going to be coming out there. Like, that's the only thing I could think of that they were actually like, if they, if they were trying to do something, maybe that's it. Because they were pounding the hell out of them, and they okay, well, they were able, they were successful there. It took them nearly nine minutes, but they were able to do it. And then the next time out, it it, it didn't seem like it was successful. Yeah, I mean, it, it only works if it works, right? <laughs> like, yeah, it's 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 a dumb theory, but that's that's all we had, right? Yeah, and that, this game was just d- full of dumb theories as to what could have worked. Well, it also like like. It, if 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 this is what we're subscribing to, like let's assume, right, that an eight minute drive against the opposing defense tires them out, it softens them up for subsequent drives, and makes it easier for you to score on subsequent drives. Why not make it a little bit more granular and talk about who we're asking to tire out? Because if I'm tiring out Shaquille Barrett and Adama Kung Su, um, that has value, but you know who's not tired? Sean Murphy Bunting and Carlton Davis who were doing nothing on half of these plays just watching receivers fake block them while CJ Ham rushes up the gut on third and one they're not tired at all right and so uh who would I, I'd rather throw a bunch of deep shots and hope some of them hit and tire out those guys because those are the guys I'm gonna have to target late in the game that's who needs to be tired um, I mean, you do happen to have one of the most explosive, I say explosive offenses, but one of the offenses that, that's ranked you know, highest for, for plays over 20 yards. Right, yeah, yeah, and and I agree that it's like it feels tough to call this an explosive offense, but by any kind of statistical measure of explosiveness in an offense, the Vikings have that, which means that in this situation, they have that potential. Um, uh, they, they were asked, uh, I think Cousins was asked, um, why they didn't uh, throw any deep shots. Let's see if I can find that. Um, I'm usually like a wizard at searching Twitter, but this one's going to be a little bit difficult to find. Um, hmm. Okay, so it's not there. Uh, but like Cousins was asked why they didn't call any uh, deep shots early on. And uh, for the most part, he was like, yeah, I don't know. I was wondering the same thing. And I was just like, Really? First of all, what are you doing on the side? Like, are you just looking at <laughs> like the de- like uh, the photos of the defense? Like that, I'm agree that that's important, right? Like he's he's just slowly but surely turning into the marionette character from uh, from Team America. Like he's just slowly but surely turning himself into that. It's like I wasn't. Yeah, I was on the I was on the sideline. Here what? it is. Here it is. I was supposed to ask a question. <laughs> yeah, right. Exactly. Like advocate for your offense, dude. Okay, so here's what it was. Um, this was actually last week so i was i was remembering a quote from the previous game you know the one that won um but why didn't the vikings take any deep shots in the first half so this is the game where they don't take a uh, a deep shot until the 40 yard or justin jefferson i don't know i'm sure it was some level of wanting to establish the run that's something i wish we had been able to do to create more explosive plays in the first half but really dude uh okay um anyway <laughs> and and this and of course this quote uh, 
you know, comes as we didn't even put this in the show notes as like the news about Stefan Diggs saying, yeah, I, I asked for a trade cause it was a run first offense. Like, Oh, everything's really coming together. Huh? <laughs> um, of course, like the, the coach of the year candidate is also a run first offense with Stefanski and the Browns, but yeah, I mean, it, it feels like we kind of know that maybe the Vikings should be using these like really explosive weapons um, uh, a little bit more often. I, yeah, I mean, it's just it's it, it's hard to it, it's it's just hard to look at this game because it was such a tough loss because it was winnable. It was far more winnable than anyone would have expected. Really, this was a game that there were plenty of options or there were plenty, there were plenty of opportunities rather that things could have gone well. And I'm not just referring to the fact that, you know, within the, within the margin of the loss, you could put the the missing points in and, and get a win. I'm not even referring to that. It's like there, there was lots of ways this could have worked out because this was not Tom Brady's best day. And as you had pointed out, a number of his overthrows were right down the middle, anywhere between 10 and 20 yards. It was like it was like clockwork. Every time he overthrew somebody, he was like, "Yep, there's another one for a reef." He was he was hitting them like wildfire on the on the left and the right, but down the middle, he was having a lot of problems. And he did have a bunch of overthrows, as we had said on the last show. Like this was a game that the Vikings could have won. Yeah, and um, and, and I find it kind of interesting. So I was looking at the the blitz splits for both teams because it felt like the the Vikings. We'll talk about um, like offensive linemen and stuff like in a second, but. Um, I was like, man, the Buccaneers are not blitzing all that often. It turns out they did blitz a fair amount. They didn't blitz as much as they usually do, but they blitzed above league average. About 34% of Vikings dropbacks were, were blitzes from the Buccaneers. It's just um, they got turned into like Kirk Cousins scrambles and stuff like that. So actually, the Vikings did do a good job against the blitz. And then I looked at how often the Vikings blitzed the Buccaneers because, you know, I advocated that they do the same thing. And they only blitzed seven times, but the Buccaneers only had 23 dropbacks in the game. And so that was actually above the Vikings. Uh, season-long blitz rate, right? So they they blitzed like 30% of the time. The Bucks blitzed 34% of the time. The Bucks season-long rate was 39. The Vikings season-long rate was 24. So Vikings blitzed more, Bucks blitzed less, but there was more than the league average for, for both teams. Um, they just weren't able to convert those into pressures. Um, Brady had a 70.8 passer rating under pressure in this game. Uh, that is a sample size of four. <laughs> so that's not great. Um, he was less effective. We had, we had a ma- we had a mailbag question about uh, the, somebody had said, you know, "Why didn't the Vikings blitz more?" And I just want to scream out, "They tried!" <laughs> yeah, right. Like <laughs> an effort was made. Yeah, and and on their seven blitzes, Brady threw at a passer rating of one hundred, which is an improvement over his game long passer rating of one hundred and twenty point nine. So yeah, I mean, they did. Uh, <laughs> um, the and, and the pass rating includes touchdowns. Like he had more yards per attempt on blitzes than not. But I think for the most part, um, we have some pretty decent evidence that that Brady was not handling the blitz all that well this year, and he was not doing it as well in this game. And the Vikings probably should have may, maybe a little been a little bit more aggressive in the blitz, but they were more aggressive than they usually were. Um, but yeah, Brady was not having his best game, like you said, especially in the first half uh, where the throws just felt like they were kind of going wild and you didn't really know what was happening. Um, it it kind of mirrored some of the stuff we saw in, in the previous four weeks of Brady where it just the fastball wasn't there. And I don't mean like the ball velocity, although that was kind of an issue on occasion as well. But more just, you know, he and the receivers were just not on the same page or he was just throwing wildly inaccurately or, or whatever. Um the second half, he was obviously a lot more composed in that respect. But, you know, for the most part, you know, the the Buccaneers got, you know, were able to take advantage of, like, penalties to kind of advance down the field, uh, which we already talked about, unless, you know, Brady playing kind of out of his mind or, or in a really stellar way. So, yeah, the game was winnable just because uh, the Bucks defense doesn't look like it did in the in the first month of the season. Brady doesn't look like he did in the first month of the season. Um the difference in execution capability, I think, based off of the previous four weeks for both teams, tells us that the Vikings probably should have been better. And for the first half, they played way better than the Bucks, and they ended up with six points because of it. Like, what an absurd stat when you look at time of possession. The, oh, the, the yeah. Vikings 
continue to win on time of possession and continue to lose the game. And it's it's just kind of astonishing to look at after the game. It's like, how in the world did they end up losing a game where they dominated it so thoroughly? Well, I mean, and the reason they, they were ahead in time of possession is because they were able to generate first downs. The Buccaneers were not. The Vikings beat them 27-17 to 17 in first downs. They had more rushing first downs, passing first downs. The only area where the Buccaneers had more first downs was by penalty, and that's only actually 3-2. to two. Um, The Buccaneers were slightly better on third down than the Vikings were, but the Vikings were way better on fourth down, right? And so uh, they were able to just create more opportunities for them to run plays. I mean, the Vikings ran 76 plays. The Bucs ran 49. Um, You know, time of possession is a stat that I don't pay a ton of attention to because I think it it tells us that the other things are going well. But here it forces us to ask the question, when the Vikings are – have the ball two to one uh, in terms of time, and they run 76 plays to 49 plays, how is it that they end up with like fewer points? Is it turnovers? Because that's usually what happens when, when a team you know, is, is ahead on the number of plays run, but is behind on the scoreboard. It's a lot of times it's turnovers or the other team is so explosive that they, that they score really quickly so they don't run that many plays or something. And it's that kind of like none of that. It's just that the Vikings, when they got to the red zone, pushed themselves back, and then they missed a couple of field goals and obviously the extra point. Um, like, yeah, you can say, hey, there's the 10 points, 24-26. That would have been nice, and then you get rid of either the Harrison Smith penalty or the offensive pass interference or the defense pass interference on the Hail Mary, and the, the Vikings end up winning. And that's all true, right? Like, Which is why you can say the Vikings got not screwed, right? Because the kicks are the kicks or, or you know, they're just an element of your own team. But like, you would have expected a team to win in that scenario, but also like there are just instances where the Vikings could have executed that they didn't. So yeah, all sorts of problems here. And I want to bring it up now because it seems like a good time to bring it up as far as like this being a winnable game. And one of the moments that it felt like things were slighted against the Vikings, the longest second in NFL history. Uh, I didn't even even remember that. Yeah. Oh my God. And there are GIFs out there that, that show it from the broadcast. The second, the, the, the game clock second being a hell of a lot slower than the play clock second. And it looked like you got at least two full seconds in before it ended up changing it, which allowed the Bucks and uh, the ability to clock the, to, to, to clock the ball, to, to spike the ball in order to stop the clock, which then led to the Hail Mary, which then led to the penalty, which then led to more points for the field goal, which then, you know, the, the, the Bucks ended up with the ball to start the third quarter. Like, all of this ended up happening within the span of, of about two minutes. And it was, inc- it was just absurd to watch. It was the longest second in NFL history. Yeah, and and the and the commentators even like remarked on it, right? They were just like, "Huh, well, you know, that's um, that, that 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 stayed at one second for quite a while, didn't it? Huh? Yep, not on Madden, not on any nowhere can you clock the ball with that little amount of time. It's not possible. You can't do that. You can't do that because if you do that, one of your line was somebody on your line wasn't set and it's a penalty and you move back and you can't and like you lose the clock, you lose the game. Or you like you lose the time and then it's going to halftime. Like you can't do that. You can't have the longest second in NFL history. It's not it's not a thing. Why is and and there are people who joke to oh, you know, Goodell was in the audience so therefore the fix was in like I I this is so stupid. <laughs> I, I had tweeted out that I hate NFL podcasts that spend like 20 minutes talking about how the refs like you know, screwed the screwed the team or whatever or or all of that. And I really feel like we're we're like edging into that. But that's the thing is you have on camera the longest second in NFL history. Yeah. Um I think one of the benefits to not always talking about how the refs screw you is that when you do talk about the refs, that maybe it's got a little bit more teeth, and that's kind of the hope here is that it it really emphasizes that um, the officiating played a a really big role in the outcome of the game. Um, And what really annoys me, actually, is so I tweeted out the Zimmer quote, right, where, uh, you know, they asked him about, you know, the Hail Mary. And Zimmer actually, I think, was maybe a little bit more diplomatic not because he wanted to be but i think because of a fine but he was a bit more diplomatic than he's been in the past where he's like yeah there were two calls that changed the complexion of the game and i'm not sure i've seen that many times 
right? With the Hail Mary, like, and you're like, okay, well, that's about as close as we're going to get to Zimmer calling out the refs for, for calling a bad game. Um, but, you know, I tweet that out, and a bunch of Bucks fans are like, you know, penalties weren't the reason you lost. Like, you know, make your field goals or whatever. And it's like, yeah, I agree. Like, they should make their field goals. Like, that, no one is disagreeing that the Vikings had opportunities to win that they lost. But, like, if the Bucks don't score that final touchdown, like, I, d- does a lot of this matter? Like, yeah, I mean, it, it still matters because the Vikings were down multiple scores, but, like, the game plays differently, right? Like, if you if the Vikings made all their kicks, they would have lost, right? If nothing else changes, right? Because they're down two. But the uh, other kind of annoying addition is that um, the Buccaneers got opportunities for touchdowns that wouldn't have existed otherwise. So that's the problem. Yeah, it's it's unquestionable. This ended up playing a massive part in this game, and it's just it's just infuriating. It's it's dumb as hell. It is it's something that. And and the other problem is that because of where we are in the season, this is something that is going to drastically affect whether or not the Vikings end up going into the playoffs. And, you know, there was still some hope of, you know, of a playoff run. This is an incredibly, incredibly inconsistent team, but inconsistent teams can get hot. You can have a team that looks terrible in week 17 and go on to win the Super Bowl. New York Giants losing to the Vikings week 17 getting destroyed. Going on to the to go on uh, going on to to beat the perfect season of the Patriots looking right at you. Like inconsistent teams can do this. You just if you get to the playoffs, there's a chance. And there is a real good possibility the Vikings aren't going to end up making the playoffs and have to go perfect here and they ah, does anyone trust this team? <laughs> right, yeah, yeah. I mean, if the Vikings go anymore. perfect, I think they've got a greater than 99% chance of making the playoffs. If I take a look at the the 538 thing here for the Vikings. This is an this is an 8 and 8 team. This is maybe maybe 7 and 9, but this is this has just got 8 and 8 written all over it. This is like a Jeff Fisher special. So the Vikings have an 86% chance of making the playoffs if they win out. Um, which means, I guess, cheering for the Rams? No, actually, now you've got to cheer for... Yeah, cheering for the Rams. Um, because if the Rams beat the Cardinals in Week 17 and the Vikings went out, the Vikings secure the seventh seed. But yeah, the Vikings have to beat Chicago, which I guess that's at home, right? Um, but And beat Detroit in Week 17 at Detroit, which you know does not seem... Detroit's played a lot better since Patricia got fired, so I do want to acknowledge that. Matt Stafford has once again been playing really incredibly well. But and his ribs the the the, the word for the word today was that the rib injury was a, neg- a negative for for you know for actually being broken. Right. So you would expect him to play. But are you confident at all in the Vikings' ability to win all of these games, <laughs> especially with what's happened over the last three weeks? I mean, obviously not, but. Uh... I'm not rooting for them to lose. I'm just saying I I, I, no, have I, a I, lack I can't of I can't possibly be confident about it. It's just No. The possibility exists. That's all. The Vikings have a seventeen percent chance or, or about a one in six chance of making the playoffs at this point. Um if they had beaten the Bucks, they would have had a seventy percent chance essentially of making the playoffs. But actually they were seventeen percent at the conclusion of the game. Some games did swing their way, I think, since then. Um, so they're, they're a little bit higher. They're like one and five, but it's still, you know, the odds are greater, right? That they won't make the playoffs about four and five odds that they won't make the playoffs. But yeah, um, wild, right? Because like, I mean, this Bucks game was the pivot point of the, it's the highest leverage game that they had remaining on their schedules, the pivot point in the season. And it also would have demonstrated that the Vikings would have been able to actually make some noise once they got into the playoffs, which I guess they could, right? If they had made their kicks, right? Like that's that's a team that is formidable, right? A team that consistently gets into uh, opponent territory against a top-level defense and finds ways to score, right? Which is what the Vikings were essentially doing had they made their kicks. But they didn't, so uh, they're a losing team, and uh, they have to win out, right? I think if they what, if they beat Chicago and Detroit and they lose to New Orleans, they still have a one-in-three chance of making That's dumb. Um but yeah, they they almost certainly have to win out if they want to make the playoffs. Otherwise, they have to rely on some like pretty remarkable luck, like the 
the Rams uh, beating out the Cardinals in Week 17, and uh, and a couple of other things to fall their way, like the the Cardinals losing to San Francisco, maybe. That Christmas game, that Christmas game against the Saints, looks bigger and bigger, and it's it, are is it going to be Taysom Hill? Is it going? There, I think it's going to be Drew Brees. Uh, I well, we'll we'll yeah, see. we'll see. We, we maybe we can't know at this point. No, Drew. It would it, to me anyway. It would make more sense for Drew Brees to come out on Week 17 and be like, "All right, I'm I'm ready for the playoffs. I'm ready for the playoffs." Yeah, <laughs> Just, uh, Schefter reported let, let yesterday that Brees will not really be available for Week 15 against the Chiefs, though he, you know, wants to be. Which that's I'm glad he reported that part too. Like oh, I didn't know Brees wanted to be healthy. That's good. They clinched the uh, the number one seed yet? The Saints or the Chiefs? Yeah, the, the Saints. Uh, I don't think so because the Packers are in it. Oh, that's right. Okay, so I we'll we'll see we'll see what ends up happening if Taysom Hill starts losing. We'll yeah. uh, we'll we'll see what the Saints end up doing there. But so I think the Rams I, are probably the best team in the NFC, which is like not a remarkable. This is not a good NFC, NFC year. <laughs> yeah. No, this is not this is not a good NFC year. The AFC has a couple of really really good teams and uh the NFC has the Packers which are not bad this year. Yeah. And and and, and Aaron Rodgers is playing like a man possessed. Good. Uh the Saints have the aging Drew Brees who is wild every time he drops back or Taysom Hill who is wild every time he decides <laughs> yeah. to, to, to drop back. Uh, they have the Bucks, kind of. You have the Rams, which is a, which is an interesting team. Uh, you have, I mean, is San Francisco still in? Nah, I can't even remember. I, I wouldn't say San Francisco. Um, well, they're not like out of it, out of it. They've got like a one in 10 chance of making the playoffs. But yeah. I would say, yeah, I wouldn't count San Francisco as one of the right. teams that... Would comprise you that. have DK Metcalf and the Seahawks. Um, yeah, if they don't like goose as, up like they did against the Giants, wow. Yeah, that's the thing is that they lost to the Giants, and then you have the Giants who are like tripping over their own shoes to like to like to to win the to potentially win the NFC East because that's still up for grabs. It's still, so like it's, it's still is. the the NFC. This is not a strong NFC team. A, any anyway, that's let's 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 put a cap on the uh, on the on this Bucks preview because we've already gone way too long on this just bizarre game. Is there anything else that we should just quickly state out about the offensive line uh, and the uh, and the offensive line, defensive line, and the corners? Just while we're on our way out. Yeah, I would say uh, good game by the corners, despite the pass interference stuff, given the difficulties they had in terms of the quality of matchup they had. Um, I think there's a lot of promise in those two young corners. So that's really great. Offensive line, really poor job. Uh, Kirk Cousins got pressured on 46.8% of his dropbacks, which may have been a league high um, this week uh, as, as potentially the most pressured uh, quarterback in the NFL. Um, actually, I just I might as well just take a look at it because I, I have it up here. Um, let's see, week 14, most pressured quarterback under pressure. Here we go. Um, it was not because the combined efforts of the Giants were the most pressured quarterback, but it was it, otherwise it's like Cousins and Allen are basically tied for the most pressured quarterback in the NFL uh, this week. Uh, and that was a product of a poor offensive line. Uh, Evidently, according to PFF, Rashad Hill did well. I did not pay a ton of attention to Rashad Hill after he was asked to replace Brian O'Neill. Brian O'Neill was struggling. Um, I thought Riley Reef had some issues. Garrett Bradbury had a couple of issues. Um, but the real problem was Dakota Dozier, who just played really poorly. And it's not like Ezra Cleveland played a ton better. Um, if you take a look sack by sack, who gave them up? I think technically it was Ezra Cleveland, but I think Dakota Dozier just played worse like just really bad football so that's all worth saying would have been nice to see more justin jefferson would have been nice to see um a little bit more adam Thielen. although Thielen did get pretty involved uh at, at points in the game um but yeah offensive line really great at run blocking it looked like but man that pass protection was just brutal yeah i think that's kind of an understatement 
Uh, and and just at the worst times, it, it seemed like it seemed to fall apart. Like if it was a third down or a fourth down, it was it, it was it was third down. It was like a almost a guarantee of a sack. But like a fourth down, uh, at the very end of the game, man, that yeah, you you could have you you obviously could have predicted it. I I knew that was coming when it when it was happening. But man, that was that was just ugly to watch. Let's uh, let's move on from this abomination of a football game. And uh, and talk about something else. The North Code uh, Fantasy League playoff weekend, uh, absolute catastrophe. Yeah, disastrous. Just the the worst slash best mm-hmm. weekend I think I've, I've seen for the North Code League. Just really one for the ages. Bodies when they, everywhere. When they finally when they finally write the book on the 2020 North Code season whether it be the podcast or whether it be the fantasy league, man, this was a week for the ages as far as missed kicks. And I'm actually pulling up the stat right now on the kickers that missed extra points. And Brandon, Brandon McManus is the first person I, I am thinking. I of. can't believe like, like obviously I can believe it because like, of course this would happen. Right. But like, yep. I picked the guy that missed the fewest extra points over the last, I want to say, three years. Like, he missed fewer extra points than anyone else because his percentage was, I think, top three, and his teams wouldn't score touchdowns. Like, that was the thing. That was the reason I kicked. Uh, I picked him in every league. You know, people are picking people like Justin Tucker in the first round, and I'm like, that's terrible value. People are picking. Nope, it served me so well until this ish. week. <laughs> right. Uh, people are picking like, ah, oh, Graham Gano hasn't missed a kick in a while. Like, I get it, right? But like, I picked a guy who I the offense was projected to be bad, and so he wouldn't have that many opportunities to kick extra points, and his historical extra point rate was great. And on top of that, his historical field goal rate, which is a larger sample, was also fantastic. He's a great kicker in a bad offense. I picked him for every single one of my leagues, and he misses two extra points. I like I can't. Good God! And like there's let's, let's, there's so many missed extra points. Like Jason Myers, Tyler Bass, Ryan Suckup, Brandon McManus with two. Dan Bailey. So I'm down 50 and I made the playoffs in all three of the North code leagues I made <laughs> and I'm down 50 in all of them off the bat. And like, yep. I don't know that I would have won any of them because I just had like some pretty awful luck elsewhere as well. Um, no, I would have won. I would have won that matchup. So never mind. Um, I would have won one of the other three. So it's not like, like I, I would have absolutely destroyed, but like, good God, like, Actually, no, I would have won two of them. I, I miscounted because I, I missed that Justin Tucker is, I assumed that Justin Tucker wasn't going to miss any. But yeah, um, I would have won two of these three if it wasn't for Brandon McManus. And on top of that, if I had won anyway, the guy got COVID. I would have had to find a new kicker after this. <laughs> like, come on. This league, I've said it before, I'll say it again. This league doesn't make character, it reveals it. This is, this is, this is my legacy. This league is is my baby, and of course, I get knocked out of the playoffs due to Justin Tucker's kick getting blocked. Ah! And um, it wasn't even like, well, I mean, your process was bad, but it wasn't even like the thought process behind your process was incorrect, right? Like, Justin Tucker doesn't miss, and he didn't, like, miss. It was blocked. <laughs> like, I, he didn't screw up. <laughs> this team, you know, I've... I, I've got questions. Is all <laughs> I haven't. I don't want to. I don't want to say that I'm going to get. You know, I'm not. I'm not saying I'm getting rid of Justin Tucker. I want to talk to the team first. I, I want to check. Like, you know, I want to check the temperature of the room before I do anything. Like, before I b- potentially bring somebody in. But man, I if if you he was Justin Tucker was in fact available or was was in fact starting. In all four of the Norse Code leagues, I mean, of course he was. Is he, he's, he's? I picked him number one. He's the greatest in the kicker leagues. in history. Of course he was. <laughs> and I, I, he he swung the game. He swung two playoff games, and he was on a team that was already in a bye. Like in the end, of the fourth game, it it, it didn't matter. 
but like just oh my god yeah this was a this was a rough one so one two three four five six seven eight missed extra points this week by uh yeah by seven by seven people so dad bailey missed no. three field goals will lutz missed two field goals uh sergio castillo missed three field goals Aldrick Rosas missed a field goal. Jake Elliott missed a field goal. Jason Sanders missed a field goal. Dustin Hopkins missed a field goal. And then, extra point wise, um, obviously we've got Dan Bailey and Brandon McManus, but also Ryan Suckup, Tyler Bass, Jason Myers. Um, by the way, this is a pretty good explanation of why it's going to be kind of difficult to find a kicker. Um, yeah. Because, like, there, there's a kicker out there that also missed three field goals. I mean, he plays for the Jets. I mean, you know, but like still, <laughs> Will Lutz missed too. This is, yeah, this is just this is just absurd. This this I I can't, you know, and I I deserve a, a bit of this because I champion it so hard and it is part of my brand. But seriously, I I actually wanted to win that league and I really thought I had a shot, but the Norse Code fantasy gods decided no that's absolutely not what we're going to be doing so do so so we do we have four appearances in the playoffs between between the two of us i would have to look and i'm i'm too sad to look right okay, now well, i i we'll, 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 we'll potentially talk about that on thursday i, I just i think it's so look. hilarious that we had four shots and we got yep. <laughs> we got bounced in the first round in all of them this was, and, and you know, people people always expect the crazy stuff to happen in the first week of the of the fantasy playoffs. Oh yeah, there were implications. This was <laughs> this was a big week <laughs> for for the Norse Code leagues as far as those mixed uh, missed extra points. Just just tragic. Let's talk about something else that's tragic. Is uh, just before we hit the mailbag, uh, the Dinky Town McDonald's. Is oh, now closed. Oh my god! I, I got told this in the middle of the game, man. I can't believe it. I have spent a I spent a number of evenings uh, ending up there uh, over <laughs> the uh, there. over the period of time. Aimless <laughs> for plan. some reason. You, you never plan on going to the Dinky Town McDonald's. It just kind of happens. And there were plenty of evenings that started off at the Varsity Theater. Or started off at uh, the library, or that uh, burrito place that was right next to the library and right next to the parking lot, which I can never remember the name. Uh, of. Burrito Loco. Yes, yeah. Burrito Loco. Yeah, I across some, the street across real- the street from that like terrifying concrete apartment building, the Chateau. Oh my God, that thing is t- that like out of a horror movie. Yeah, <laughs> like every time you walk by it, you just expect to hear a clap of thunder. Right. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> it, it is the word looming. <laughs> exactly just unsettling i i didn't even go to u of m and i spent a lot of time in dinky town because of uh of stuff over at uh because i had friends who lived down there and we would end up going to the library we would end up going to burrito loco or a ton of shows over at the varsity before the owner got called out for the sleaze ball that he was yeah and uh and as a result a lot of evenings were spent over at the dinky town mcdonald's uh, lots of evenings that I can kind of recollect. Yeah, I, uh, I I shepherded a bunch of my friends who ended up at the Dinky Town McDonald's. Dude, that that place was so funny, dude. Because like, obviously, the collection of characters that you get there at like three a.m. really fantastic, great stories. Um, the fact that it turned into an impromptu bus stop and they tried to stop that like every other year, but they couldn't. <laughs> uh, really fantastic. Um, the fact that for the longest time they didn't accept credit cards, like, because like, like it's McDonald's, right? Like, this this isn't like Al's Breakfast, right? Like, it's not like a mom and pop. Like, oh, you, you don't accept cards? I get it, cash. You know, you don't have to pay the the credit card fee to the credit card transaction people or whatever. And uh, you know, you cash your small business, but this is a McDonald's and they're cash only, and it was nuts. And it didn't click for me until my sophomore year when I saw them like write new prices on a piece of paper at like 2 a.m., write new prices on a piece of paper and just like put the handwritten prices over the dollar menu. And I just saw (laughs) drunk people order off the dollar menu. Shady as hell. Yeah. And it's like, obviously you're, obviously you're a cash only business and, and 
and you're tricking drunk people and skimming off the top. Like that's obviously what you're doing. That's amazing. I love how sleazy this is. That's incredible. And there's like this US bank ATM inside that charges just an insane like strip club level transaction fee for this ATM, right? <laughs> yep. Like just nuts. <laughs> And and people are like blitzed out of their mind, like working the ATM and paying this insane fee, having withdrawn the wrong amount of money, going back to the ATM and you know incurring the fee again, and then paying like eight dollars for two dollars worth of food, and and the person behind the counter is pocketing six dollars of it probably. And it is the only place I have ever seen, the only McDonald's I've ever seen that ever had a tip jar out. Right? Yeah. I'm like, what is this place? <laughs> <laughs> and, it, 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 just, it, and it's like a double decker, right? It's like one of the McDonald's that they wanted to invest in. And they just were like, yeah, uh, I don't know what happened. The city municipal code says we can't have a credit card machine or whatever lie they were telling McDonald's corporate. Like, what? <laughs> <laughs> I I once watched uh, is like the music playing in the McDonald's. Uh, at the at one point, the music was playing outside of the outside of McDonald's, and we were sitting out there. I watched uh, uh, I watched a homeless person come up and sing along to the song that was playing you know, over the speakers, and then another, and then a homeless woman came over, and the two of them just started dancing, and they had this like nice romantic moment, and <laughs> just like like only in Dinky Town <laughs> would this be a thing, and just like and and you saw all, all the people like. Aww, yeah, yeah, <laughs> like having, so great. having a real, just a real beautiful moment outside of the dinky, t- like you hear places like outside the seventh street entry, uh, or, you know, the, you know, the, the hard, like the hard rock that used to exist at block E you hear places kind of identified in, in, in songs about Minneapolis. For whatever reason, the Dinky Town McDonald's has has escaped all of that. P- probably for good reason, because if you were there at, at at two or three in the morning, it was never for a good reason. Oh yeah, it's just like the closest just, I got to a good reason was I was pulling an all nighter. Uh, that I'm sure that's your shocked face. Uh, and absolutely, yeah. And I was like, oh man, I'm really hungry, you know. And and so uh, the two of us were studying together. We go out. And we're like, man, there's no places that are open. Obviously, the McDonald's is open because they close at inconsistent times because, of course, they do. Um, and we we had to that, – that's also one of my favorite things. About the, you just had to bet on whether or not it was going to be open at some time <laughs> after three. Like, is it? I don't know. Is it open? And, like, at four, maybe they start cleaning it so they close it. But maybe not. Like, who knows? Uh, and so we walked over there and we ordered, like, 40 McNuggets and because uh, they had, like, that 40 McNugget thing for idiots like us. And we ordered 40 McNuggets, probably ended up with 60, honestly, like just in a, like in a bag. Like, I don't even like, there's a thing for the 40 McNuggets, like the little carton that they put it in. They just put it in a bag for us, which is also shady as hell, but also we got probably 20 extra nuggets. So like, yep. I'm not complaining. And we brought it back and we got sick off the McNuggets because who eats 60 McNuggets? That's a, that's a good way to get uh, some kind of a, <laughs> Some kind of, uh, of of terrible illness. This is also the only McDonald's I've ever seen where you could barter. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> like I'm pretty sure that's not something that they teach in corporate. But this was a McDonald's that I, I had literally seen uh, somebody pay for uh, pay for uh, like a Big Mac with a swig off a bottle of Southern Comfort. This was just a this was a magical place that is now closed. <laughs> I wonder if they ever did start taking credit cards. Like, did they? They did. They did end up. They they did end up taking. Like, that was so. uh, In the thread where someone told me that the McDonald's was closing down, I was like, "Well, really, the beginning of the end of that McDonald's is when they started taking credit cards and professionalizing." Like, oh yeah, the the moment that you tried to turn that into a real McDonald's is is when that thing died. Yeah, like when they when they (laughs) stopped scamming drunk people, you knew it was over. Oh yeah, (laughs) they were part of it. You go to the Wiener Circle in Chicago to be insulted. You go to the McDonald's in Dinky Town and expect a show. <laughs> like this was about as close to that as you were going to get. But yeah, you had uh, you had mentioned it. I saw it on Twitter as well that the the McDonald's after something like forty seven years uh, is closed. <laughs> it's like man, that's a that there's a, there's a lot of shady stuff that happened in that uh, in that particular building. I. I, I can't even. 
yeah, I spent way too much time in that neighborhood, especially over by the uh, uh, over by the varsity, and we would park over by the McDonald's. And sure enough, <laughs> somebody would need to sober up a little bit, so we'd have to stop there. And dinner and a show, truly better than the Chanhassen Dinner Theater. Dinner and a show. Ugh. Uh, let's go to the mailbag and let's knock out these uh, these kicker questions quick. Raul asks, if we're drafting a punt returner in the fifth round, when are we drafting a kicker? Uh, fifth round. Yeah, fifth round. I'm envisioning a postmodern team not kicking field goals. Is it feasible? In neutral, in neutral game situations at the 20 or 30 yard lines, when do the analytics say that the fourth down distance is long enough to make kicking worthwhile? So neutral situations, oh, they've got one at rbsdontmatter.com. Uh, between the 20 and 30 yard lines, so let's say what, we're, we're mid-game in the second half, there's like eight minutes left in the quarter, uh, everyone's got everyone's timeouts, um, yards to go, yeah, that's what we're trying to find out. Yards between the 20 and the 30, right? Minnesota's, this calculator has so much stuff on it. Okay. And the home team is Tampa Bay. All right. Cool. Update. The spread line must be length. Okay. Come on, dude. I, just give me the thing. Why would they give me the thing? Okay. I don't know. The answer is I don't know because I don't want to deal with it. <laughs> well, then. Uh, also, if you could Stefan Diggs yourself to another team, which team would it be? We all know Arif's answer, but what about Oh my you, God, come on. <laughs> well, I mean, it even said in The Athletic the other day that you were a... Uh, I, I uh, didn't noted, write that. That's not fair. I'm, uh, it, was, it was printed in The Athletic. I'm, they are your employer. I would assume they would have the most updated information. They were playing a joke. They were, it, was all, it was jokes on me. Um, I do not consent. <laughs> is, is that what you're going to start claiming now? Yeah. <laughs> I, I had no desire to be a part of any of this uh, tomfoolery. I, I also, I figured out this calculator. I figured out what I was doing wrong. I'm not going to tell you what it was. Uh, about fourth and seven is is where if it's an average field goal kicker that you're you're you begin to kind of break even, which is kind of dumb. Uh, fourth and six, also you you per, slightly prefer the field goal, but uh, between the twenty and the thirty, yeah. Um, but if we assume that the kicker is unlikely to make the kick, then uh, what, what are the odds? Fourth and 13, let's see. Um, so field goal attempt, 80% success rate. Let's say it's a 40% success rate. Um, if you fail, uh, your win percentage is 26%. If you succeed, it's 38%. Um, go for it. Um, your success rate is, is half that of the 40% success rate that we've kind of jimmied together. If you fail, um, you've got a 28% uh, percent win percentage uh, versus if you succeed, a 46% win percentage. So um, th- around the 4th and 10 or 4th and 12 mark is where the yards to go at, at about the 25 um, is about where if we assume ha- the half the success rate of your kicker, um, you begin to uh, you begin to like say, hey, you know, 4th and 10. That's go for it territory in a neutral situation. So if I was going to Stefan digs myself to another team, uh, after Ben Roethlisberger retires, I could probably think about, uh, think about the Steelers just because that was my dad's or that is I say that in past tense. Uh, <laughs> that was the dad. That was the team that my, my dad would, uh, would cheer on because when he would watch in the seventies, they would be the team that would beat the Cowboys and he hated the Cowboys because the Cowboys were on every week. So that, that that hatred oh. has never gone away. All right. So I, I would I would I mean, probably it's the same reason you that I have a, a slight uh more of a of a like toward the Cubs because he would watch the he would always watch WGN, he would always watch the Cubs games. Like even though I ended up being a twins fan, it's like okay, yeah, the, the Cubs are on. I'll, I can I can watch a little bit of that. So I would uh, I would send myself over there once Ben Roethlisberger retires. The best thing I saw about Ben Roethlisberger this weekend was that he is throwing the ball like a man who uh, just ate himself silly at Thanksgiving dinner, and then people <laughs> told him yeah. like, hey, let's go out and let's go and throw the pigskin. Like. All right. <laughs> <laughs> that was great. We'll, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll try. I think I could do uh, I could do the Cardinals because they're about to be pretty exciting. I could do uh, the Browns because existential despair is pretty easy to port from one franchise to another. Oh, yeah. Um, that's, yeah. Uh, plus, I mean, you always get to talk about the draft. I mean, that sounds exciting. 
Um, <laughs> That's pretty good for your brand. Yeah. yeah. The Jets I wouldn't want to do after all the Manish Meta stuff came out. That sounds awful. I don't want to be in that media environment. The Lions seem fine. I, I like all the Lions people. Yeah, the Lions could be the Lions could be interesting. It's just that Matt Stafford is going to go away now. Oh and, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. I th- yeah, so I that, think it's the Cardinals. Yeah. Uh, Delta BC Dad asks, "Is this how the Vikings tank? Sending out a kicker out on three attempts after they should have yanked him after the first PAT and field goal miss?" I mean, we talked like I don't think that there was like a a reasonable other decision because I think um, you've seen kickers miss multiple kicks in a game before and then make a kick. Um, and uh, which I mean, w- wasn't the first game of the year this year that like Steven Guskowski missed like two kicks in a row and then he made the game winner. Yep. Yeah, exactly. Well, these, these things happen and you just, and you have to just accept it and move on. So yeah, it's a, a kicker can reclaim his footing, so to speak and, and make awful. a kick. I, I wasn't trying these, these things just happen. I'm, <laughs> I'm not, I, I am both not this witty and not this terrible. It just happens at 1 a.m. Shut up. <laughs> so that, that, that's, a, that's something that'll be fine to quote out of context. But these, these sorts of things happen. This is something that, that almost you could say would be expected. Is okay, well, he missed three. He can't possibly miss four. Oh, there it goes. <laughs> He's due. <laughs> He's, well, that's the thing. I think I even, I even tweeted out. It's like, this is all, this is all setting up. For when Dan Bailey wins it for us in overtime. <laughs> like, <laughs> these things happen. Uh, Patrick asks, what year will it be when I will not have to worry about the Vikings kicking game? Ever since Anderson in 98, I've never felt good about it, except for maybe the Longwell years. So actually, I didn't even see ne- the Longwell years part of this tweet. But yeah, actually, the Longwell years. Um, yeah, you will never get a respite. Yeah, I mean, we talked about this last week. We were just like... You know, if you make every kick, Vikings fans are going to be concerned that the announcers are going to say he's made every kick and then miss a kick. Uh, or if if you miss two kicks in a game, you're like that guy misses all the time now. And you could have the best kicker on the. You could have Justin Tucker, right? And he missed twice in a game, but because of your history of a Vikings fandom, you're like, I don't know if we can trust this guy. I don't know if we can trust uh, kicking a field goal to win the game. You can't do that. Like they have to miss once occasionally with long stretches of time. Like that's the only time Vikings fans will ever get close to trusting a kicker, which by the way, that was long. Well, like, you know, yeah, you don't, you didn't ask him to kick 50 yards that often. So that was kind of part of the problem, but you know, when he missed, it wasn't in a clutch situation and, uh, they were, they were pretty far apart in terms of misses. So you never really felt like he was, he was putting you in a position to let you down. But, uh, yeah, every other kicker, um, they're either missing a lot or they're not missing enough for you to feel comfortable. Uh, Vikings Wales asks, when are you guys going to have an extra point kicking contest and what are the stakes? Uh, never. What? No, absolutely not. <laughs> you sure? I, I, uh, we could go. I, I think that that should be the, the, next, the next Patreon stuff. We'll, we'll, I'll we'll mask up. We'll head out to a field somewhere, some high school field that's not being used and, uh, and see who can go from 15. I can't wait to hurt myself for content again. <laughs> <laughs> Just, <laughs> all right so we filmed this also don't ask why Arif is in the dirt we'll talk about it on the next episode <laughs> you, you just send out the the post-mortem picture like yeah we had an extra point of kicking contest uh anyway tune in to find out why Arif looks dead <laughs> I mean, like no this is not a more lifelike uh this is not a more like life like realistic fo- uh, picture made by drawn pl- draw play Dave. Arif actually didn't, you know, it's just in the dirt here naturally <laughs> yes. uh, to charger to Viking to Brown to jet, etc. How do all of these curse franchises manage to have so much in common, but do at the same time, such a unique thing for their curse. And in what characteristics makes the Vikings curse so unique? Is it the hope? I think the hope plays a role. I think the hope separates them from the brand to the jets, but the Chargers also kind of have that, right? Because they tend to be very talented on offense and defense. Um, this year, for example, the Chargers have been in a bunch of close games and they've just lost them, right? Uh, I think I think for the Vikings, the, the thing that makes their curse unique is that you can't really predict what it is that's going to doom them. Like for the Chargers, you can say, oh, special teams will put them behind and then they'll throw a back-breaking pick. Done. I get it. I'm a Chargers fan. Brand. Now. Right. Hashtag brand. But like uh, for the Vikings, it's just like 
I don't know. I uh, the former kick returner that uh, you know they they drafted and developed and is now the best kick returner in NFL history. Uh, we're gonna kick it to him, and oh my god, he scored! Wow, who could have seen that coming? Crap. Or like, yeah, we got a track guy. Um, he has played football twice in his life, once in college, kind of. Anyway, he's our special teams gunner. Uh, also, he's just committed three penalties on one play. Like, okay, well, there's that. Right, you could have the backbreaking fumble. You could have a backbreaking pick. We've seen a bunch of those for the Vikings. You could have the missed kick, and like the the Vikings have like motifs and themes, right, in their curse, right? Like they've got special teams failures and in particular kicking failures. But there's just so many unique ways they find ways to lose. In addition to all of that, like I think the Vikings curse is one of variety. Well, like the 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 Browns they're bad right the Jets they're bad and hey the Browns aren't bad this year so we'll see kind of what happens to their curse but the Jets they're bad the Browns have been bad the Chargers have been mindlessly destructive but they implode in a much the same way kind of like you know a comfortable blanket right um, like you you know kind of all the contours this feels comfortable I know what this is like but for the Vikings it's just like variety it's the spice of life right like it's just it's so unique the way that they break your heart like i mean okay so you've got 38 7 and the 2009 nfc championship games and people were reminded of them of each other even though they were like nothing alike 38 7 wasn't a close game 2009 was um that one featured you know some ref shenanigans it featured a team that it turns out was cheating um but it also featured a backbreaking pick right it featured like a a a, a f- phantom pi like that all counts right um but there you also have the blur walsh misses right like blur walsh scores every point for the vikings against the seahawks every single point like he could come out of this like the goat right teddy's not scoring peterson's not scoring whoever the hell teddy's peterson's throwing to fu- isn't scoring Peterson's fumbling yeah peterson fumbled on a catch of all things right um and, and, and Blair Walsh makes like an insane, like conditions that are so cold that the Vikings were like, all right, you're going to need to bring some styrofoam to the game. And also we're providing free coffee so that people don't die. Like that's how cold it was. Right. And, and, and like, they gave like guidelines for dressing in layers and Blair Walsh is out there like kicking and he's making, like he's nailing these kicks, like a 50 yard or a 40 yarder. And they're like, all right, we got it. We're down to the 27 yard line. And you mi- and you misses right like every different Vikings loss is just has its own flavor. Like the Vikings lose to a tight end playing quarterback against the Bills in, in the in the most favored game in the NFL slate. I think that year a seventeen point favorite Vikings. Um, now obviously it ends up that Josh Allen turned out to be pretty good this year, but that year I mean he was just awful, right? Um, but you know they lose that game. Like wow, holy crap, that's incredible. Uh, I don't know, man. Like it's it's different. The only thing is that the Vikings somehow got karmic retribution, kind of, on the Saints, like in the playoffs. That's the closest. But like, yeah, every loss is different. It's like a, a, a touchdown run back. It's um, you gave up like a forty second fourth down drive to Russell Wilson somehow because you couldn't convert on fourth and one. Ironically, against the Seahawks of all teams, like every disappointment is up- different. Or you end up in a situation where you have the longest second in NFL history. Yeah, right? Just like, throwing that out there. I don't know. It's just the Vikings will just find ways to disappoint you. And a lot of times it'll involve the kicker. But like the ones that don't really punch you, huh? Yep, that is exactly how that works. Brian Jellerson asks, Is there any way Maloof is part to blame for Bailey's ahem performance? Or is it just coincidence that he has a day like this in the same season we have possibly the worst special teams unit we've ever had? I mean, when you put it like that, it sounds like it can't possibly be a coincidence. But I mean, what did I just talk about with the Vikings? That sounds like exactly yeah. the kind of coincidence that could happen. <laughs> uh, Ryan asks, is it easier for Bailey to retire Sunday as he was already in Florida? <laughs> I, I don't think he's retiring. I think if the Vikings cut him, another team's going to sign him right. Like, what? Like, I just listed all those kickers that just missed kicks. Some of those guys I've never heard of before, and I probably won't ever hear of again. Bailey's going to get a job if he gets cut. Yeah. Uh, let's go to Damian Barrett, who asks Does the league have any rules about having to have a kicker on the roster, or is the <laughs> NFL less stringent? 
Or is the NFL less stringent than your fantasy league? But slightly more seriously, what would the analytics say about always playing fourth every fourth down within field goal range and going for two after a touchdown? Uh, I would say, so there is actually a... Um a high school team that does that like famously like Pulaski or something like that, where they go for every fourth down um, period, like regardless of whether or not they're in field goal range or deep in their own chair, they just don't have a punter. Um, and then they kick onside kicks instead of, um, instead of kickoffs. Um, but I do think they kick extra points. I'm not sure, but yeah. Um, what would the analytics say about that? I would say it, it's like, if you just substituted, go for it every single time on fourth down, you would net end up probably ahead. But all that stuff I talked about with how bad the Vikings are at game management, that would get worse, right? Like you need to be able to kind of manage if you're going to go for it, if you're going to go for two, when you only need one to win and stuff like that. So that's the problem is that if you're, if you tied the game with a touchdown and you've got to choose between an extra point kick and a two point conversion, um, I mean, even with the Vikings, you'd probably pick the extra point, right? So um, I, I mean, I, I think that, the net result is that you probably just by kind of accident end up with a better offense, right? And you end up scoring slightly more points and, and uh, you get, you know, a slightly worse field position most of the time for your defense, but you know, the times that you convert um, and prevent that field position from being a question at all um, kind of more than balances it out. So you're probably better off even if you end up making stupid decisions like going for it on fourth and 28 or something like that, just because you don't have a kicker. Um, So you you probably in a good spot if you do that, but like you'll end up with some like stupid mismanagement errors because you don't have a kicker. It's a, it's good to see that the Norse code swag from the, from the Patreon is beginning to reach its intended uh, targets. Just, uh, just got a tweet from Adam Bryant. Oh, fantastic. Who who received the Josh Freeman card <laughs> and, is, and is showing that off the Josh Freeman artistic. Uh, that whole card is just an, uh, is just an exercise in why not both the signing of Josh Freeman, the fact that they commissioned an artist to make this like beautiful picture of him. Uh, the fact that he played it all for the Vikings, the fact that I picked up this card somehow, like it's just an absolute exercise and yeah, why not? Well, what's the worst that could happen? <laughs> uh, Ian Polly says, despite the or asks, despite the fact that it looks like the playoffs are a long shot this year, how do you expect this team to stack up next year, making reasonable assumptions about offseason variables, Hunter extension, Harris leaving, etc. Division contender, fringe wild card, or endless despair? Oh, okay, so these are not mutually exclusive. <laughs> no. I I would say uh, you end up between, yeah, I'd say you'd be a division contender. I was going to say between division contender and fringe wildcard, but that doesn't make a ton of sense. Yeah, I think that you're at the bottom end of division contender. You wouldn't be a favorite to win the division, but, uh, you know, you can kind of see it happening. Um, Again, this is contingent upon health. So obviously hair sleeping would be a problem, but given kind of the improvements that we've seen from Gladney and Dancer, your defensive back group is going to be better at the beginning of next year than it was at the end of last year, despite seeing Harris leave potentially. Um, you're going to get uh, a slightly better defensive line. We'll assume that they'll probably, again, reasonable assumptions about the offseason, we'll assume that they'll probably find another defensive lineman, maybe not fix that unit, but make it a little bit better. And that's probably going to be the weakness because you'll get the linebackers back. Um, and so for the most part, I mean, you'll get worse at some positions just because you'll see the safety leave and you know maybe some other stuff might happen. Um, but that defense is probably going to be 10th ranked just because it's it's difficult to see the Vikings not having a top half defense and so that that defense is going to be better uh and right now the defense is is like pretty good by DVOA standards anyway which is kind of weird so you might have the seventh best um you know defense or something like that which is great um kind of given where you are and not having a pass rush uh offensively I would say that you're probably going to kind of move some pieces around I don't know that it's reasonable to say that Ezra Cleveland is going to be better um, but let's say you lose Riley Reef and you replace him with Ezra Cleveland. Your offensive line gets a little bit worse, but you're probably going to add another body or two. Maybe that balances out, and you've still got Thielen and Jefferson and Cousins and Cook. Uh, and so that offense is still going to have explosive elements to it. So I would say probably division contender if you've got like a top five ish offense, top seven ish offense, and a top seven ish defense. Um, but I would say it, you know, the Packers would still be the favorite to win the division. And 
in that scenario, then you've got a fringe wild card. It depends on if the NFC West continues to be interesting and improve. It depends on whether or not every quarterback in the NFC South leaves or retires. Um, can, is there a quarterback that might not leave in the NFC South? It's the fourth team. You got the Bucks, the Panthers, the Saints. In fact, oh yeah, all of them could retire, but I don't think Matt Ryan will. But um, or Bridgewater could sign a contract and leave, or I don't know what's going to happen with him. But um, yeah, whatever happens in the NFC South. But yeah, I think that you've got a pretty decent shot at competing for a wild card or or the top of the division, but not really top of the NFC. Yeah, it's it seems unlikely. Uh, Kyle Slaby asks, "What is the success of drives that include?" Uh, a uh, of drives that include second and long uh, runs versus second and long passes. My unscientific feeling is that even if you get the first on the run or the subsequent third down, you've used one of your good plays on the drive that karmically could have been used later in the same drive. Karmically. Whereas pa- yeah, karmically. Whereas passing at the subpar level twice could still get you the first down and not use the same good play. I know this is mystical fan talk, but I feel like it's more than just raw math, raw math calculations at this point. Yeah. So um, I'm going to link an article from 538. It's slightly different. It's called you called a run on a first down. You're already screwed. Um, but the premise of the article is essentially that uh, fighting for third and manageable is a bad idea. Uh, and if you take a look at it from a success rate standpoint, if you take a look at it from an averages standpoint, if you take a look at it from an explosive standpoint, whatever kind of evaluation metric that would make a ton of sense for, for you to use, like if you're concerned about risk aversion, well, what's your likelihood of getting a negative play? Um, or if you're concerned about, um, you know, just improving your expected points from play to play, you know, what's your success rate there and what's your average expected points, like whatever you want to do, um, the run on second and long is always kind of worse. Uh, I don't. We don't have like the. Dri- I don't have the drive stats, and I'm sure I could do it, but I don't want to because that's a ton of work. Um, of the success rate of those drives, where they where they started out with second and long runs, but uh, for the most part, expected points counts all of that um, by uh, w- with their averages, right? And so, I mean, the way the model is constructed, it takes into account what people have done there. So, um, the fact that second and long runs are negative expected points. Um, as a proposition, uh, generally speaking, is, is a really good indication that the success rate on those drives and second and long runs is really, really low. Um, you don't want to be in a situation where you're passing on third down um, or even on third down at all, because if you aim for essentially converting on second down, um, your most likely outcomes are either you get a first down or you get zero yards and you're on third and long. Um, and third and long is bad. But the percentage chance that you've actually converted on second and long or your play failed, but you still got the completion and you're on third and short, you know, those chances um, are still higher than um, than the negative chance of being at third and 10 or something like that. So for the most part, the data indicates, and I'll link it in the show notes, it's close to what you're asking. The data indicates that um, for most teams all the time, like setting up, the third down is a is a losing proposition. You should uh, attempt to set up so that there's no third down at all. Next question is going to be from Kirk, who asks, for a Reef's quantum mechanics corner. Jesus Christ! If we if we all if we had all collectively turned our heads away when Gary Anderson lined up for that kick uh, and and never watched the Vikings again, would the superposition of being both multiple Super Bowl winners and in a cursed fan base, a franchise rather, were to die being preferable to knowing that we are almost assuredly the latter. Okay, uh, so the wording of this was confusing, um, but I think that, so the argument obviously, so, so quantum mechanics, the observer effect, um, if you're not observing, um, you treat the, the quantum state as if it's, if it's all probabilities that could happen at once. Um, I, I'm sure there's a physicist listening to this and I'm just butchering it, but, um, once you observe it, then the, uh, then the quantum state becomes, uh, I don't know, established. Sure. Uh, and, and, uh, and, and now, uh, physics acts as if it's like that state had occurred. Like if a particle had a 50% chance of going through 
kind of one slit when you fired it or 50% chance of going through another slit when you fired it. Um, if you don't observe, uh, the, the physics effect is evidently that it, that it's as if it had been 50% through one and 50% through the other. But if you observe it, it, it chooses one essentially in the, in the effect, um, for the rest of the experiment is as if it had cho uh, chosen that one. So that I guess is the idea. Obviously I don't know that much about quantum mechanics, otherwise I would have been able to explain that better and or explain it correctly, which I still don't know if I did, but if ever <laughs> what we're trying yeah but if every vikings fan uh during the gary anderson kick for the 1998 nfc championship game against the falcons if every vikings fan had turned their head and not watched the kick in theory and gary anderson had not watched if there were no observers of the kick gary anderson kicks it and immediately the visor just shuts in front of him like you know like like the star wars visor for luke um just shuts down in front of his eyes so nobody can see it we have no indicate. There's no observable way for us to know that that uh, that that kick goes through. Well, we're uh, now exist. Uh, now we exist in a universe where we have to treat it as if there was a 99 percent probability that it had gone through and a one percent probability that it hadn't, and all of those things that occurred at once. And um, the net effect is that the Vikings gain point two nine nine points. Uh, which wins them the game. And so then they go to the Super Bowl, and obviously they win, so long as we never determine whether or not that kick actually went through. Um, I think that's how that works. Um, and so th There's an episode of Doctor Who that really, really fights this whole idea. We don't, you don't, we don't have to worry about thinking about this too much. So No. <laughs> There's, I'm just thinking of, a, of, a, uh, of an episode of, of the new, newer series, of Doctor Who, where it, a, a fixed point in time was messed with, and all of a sudden everything with time just happened all at once. You had Winston Churchill talking about MP3 downloads, like that sort of like everything happening at once. I, sort of I thing. can't imagine that one of the the fixed points in time that the universe is hinged upon is the 1998 NFC Championship game, right? Like I disagree this is a fixed point in time it always happened and will always continue to happen well actually uh, no hold on the vikings still lose if it's 2.99 points so yep. nothing changes oh my god <laughs> i'm saying there seems to be more and more evidence now that this was something that was always supposed to happen there should be a wikipedia page for the nfc championship game here but there's no link <laughs> well Norse code should have a wiki as well, apparently. So we'll, we'll, we'll see what ends up happening from that. Uh, three quick questions from Kenneth Allen, giving the practice squad protections. Would you cut Bailey or give him more time to work it out? I think we've already yeah. established that we would rather work him out. Uh, given how bad the defensive line is, why don't they blitz more often? They are trying. Yeah. They, they blitz more <laughs> often this weekend than they did uh, most weeks. Um, and then also, it, it really depends on the quarterback. If you're up against a quarterback that's really good against the blitz, um, you're just going to get torched more, and they're going to prevent the pressure from coming anyway. So uh, it, it really is quarterback dependent. You do blitz Aaron Rodgers, you don't blitz Phillip Rivers. I mean, that's just kind of the thing. So uh, if you can't get pressure, that sucks. Uh, now, now you're just worse. But all of your opportunities to remedy that will make you even more worse, if that makes sense. So that's probably why. Even more worse. Uh, also, any non-football podcast recommendations for an eight-hour drive? Yeah, the, the first thing that popped up in my mind is uh, Hardcore History. Um, I think it was that Dan Carlin, I think. Um, it Hardcore yes. History. Yeah. Uh, yeah, if you need to listen to somebody talk about something in a really engaging manner for like eight hours, um, yeah, just pick one of his series. He's got... I think that his most famous one is probably the Genghis Khan series, but he's got a ton of them. Uh, the World War One, I, I thought, one was really good. Um, he's got a, a Persia one that uh, was pretty good. Um, but there's like a bunch of hardcore history. Um, he's got a, uh, a one on the on the history, I think, of the um, of of the Pacific Theater on World War Two. I want to say, um, and uh, and yeah, I mean, they're all like hour long episodes um that are like five uh, that and and they're like five parts so um i would say find hardcore history um some of them are always behind a paywall some of them are always uh free he changes which ones they are um I, i'd recommend just 
they, they're not very expensive. I just recommend paying, for, especially the the Genghis Khan one is the most popular one. So I'd recommend just paying for that one. Wrath of Khans. Yeah. Um, I've I've recommended the Bugle before, uh, especially because the earlier episodes had John Oliver on it, and John Oliver was fantastic. Um, you know, there's I tend to kind of go in different ways as far as some of these go, like crime and sports is one of my favorite podcasts or, or was, I, I haven't listened to it a lot lately, but they take an athlete and then go super in depth on his, on his career and the crimes that he committed. Uh, one of my favorites, uh, being the member of the Raiders who ended up, who was going to be playing the Super Bowl and ended up in like Mexico <laughs> <laughs> and like it was, it was on and was just having an episode of like manic depressive or whatever, uh, or bike bipolar ended up in Mexico instead of in like playing in the Super Bowl that game. And that was like the 2000, like one or 2000 Super Bowl. Jesus. And so there's the, oh, okay. yeah, there's all, yeah, there's all sorts of things from that. And from, you know, famous NFL players, uh, famous wrestlers, uh, Olympians, they, they tend to cover all like crime in sports and it's, it's, they, they do it in a pretty entertaining way for about two ish hours. So if you, if you're looking to knock some time off there, there is a potential there. Uh, big Tony asks, does CJ ham need more touches? Well, I mean, the I, offense did score, but I would say no. <laughs> I, I think he is getting an adequate amount. Maybe, maybe too many in a yeah, row. We don't want to overham ourselves here. No, do not overham yourself. Uh, speaking of, of pork, Mark Ward asks, what do you guys call small sausages wrapped in bacon normally had at Christmas? Apparently pigs in a blanket are a different thing in the U.S. Yes, they are. That is not pigs in a blanket right. in the U.S. That's like you take the grand um, croissant thing, right? The grand rolls. That's it. Correct. And you wrap them around the tiny hot dogs. That's pigs in a blanket. Um, I don't know. I've seen them called Smokies, but also I've just seen the the tiny sausages by themselves just called Smokies too. Um, you usually just call the, you usually just call them wraps now. So, or everything can be a wrap if you really want it. To yeah. Be, so um, I don't know. Just bacon wrapped hot dogs. Yeah, the real wraps are the friends we made along the way. Uh, also, Mark Ward asks. Can't remember if you guys do much gaming, but what is your F it? I'll just play that again. Game. I've been playing a lot of Skyrim lately. Jesus Christ! I really want pigs in a blanket now. Uh, because <laughs> um, the Pittsburgh uh, the Pillsbury just does such a great job. The, anyway, um, we're not sponsored by Pillsbury, nor will we ever be. Um, no, probably not. Uh, my yeah, you know, my screw it game. Um, if if I've got it downloaded on my computer at the time, which right now I don't because my computer is broken. Uh, I would say long story, but I have no idea what happened. Um, the uh, what was the spiritual successor to to the original Star Wars Battlefront, uh, like Republic Commando or something? That game is dope. It's so good, and it's way better than the the Battlefront and Battlefront Two that they recently released by EA. Um, just really incredible stuff. Um, or I'll play Baldur's Gate, but that's a narrative driven game, so you can't just like go into it, do whatever. It's not really an open world. Um, otherwise, I'm I'm now super into like mobile games, which don't do that. That sucks. Um, it's just distracting and, and makes my ability to interact with the world around me worse. Um, <laughs> you mean you're, you're constantly looking for the imposter whenever you go to a McDonald's? Yeah, exactly. Uh, that, uh, that sounds like you. I actually, I think I mentioned it on the live show that I've been playing an absurd amount of, uh, of, uh, perfect dark, the original perfect dark on uh, the Xbox because there's a port to it and it's fantastic. And you can do online multiplayer with it as well. And because in the combat simulator, you can uh, go and use uh, and use additional like CPU people in it, and use the original like three of the original Bond maps. Like I've been, I've I've played a lot of that lately. It really, really is fun. I have killed Dusty in so many different ways (laughs) within those three maps. So as we uh, as we discussed on the live show last. uh, last or uh, last episode um also randomly like a like a civ game but like early early civ before it became super complicated really i thought civ got uh, like simpler actually i don't know <laughs> I, I i like we both like civ 4 more so I, there's not really much disagreement there i guess uh ryan asks uh 
kicking related question. Is it possible to break the surrender index by punting from the opponent's 25? Uh, so I looked it up. The uh, surrender index number is, uh, is 727.4. Um, if we look up all the surrender indices, is that what we would call that? Um, what's the, uh, where's the database for the surrender index? Uh, 140 point punt from, okay. So yeah, this, this is, this probably takes the 100th percentile, but if we look up the surrender index Twitter, which is, uh, at surrender underscore IDX 90, where they just tweet out the surrender index of anything over 90, um, look up 99th percentile, just do a, a from, uh, oh, never mind. November 10th, 2019, Cowboys have already triggered the 93rd and 99th percentile cowardly punts from Surrender Index, which seems like a heck of a thing to do. Um, so 98th percentile Surrender Index is 13.7 points. Um, 99.8th percentile is 48.45 points. And uh, surrender index of punting from the opponent's 25. Um, let's actually, let's put in the Vikings, the, the so it would be 4th and 28, right? So it's 4th down, 4th quarter. Uh, to the Vikings surrender index in that situation is 256 points, which uh, would be the most. It would be the highest, but it doesn't break it because this, this, this index is designed to just go off into infinity. Much like the uh, sadness index that the Vikings fans can have with all of this. Uh, let's go to Bryce, who asks, which players have the most to lose slash gain the last three or more games of this season? Um, most to lose or gain. So I think we'll learn the most about players like DJ Wanham, but I don't think he'll have much to lose or gain because he's just going to be on the roster next year, right? Um, but for people that... Um, have like contracts coming up, you know, like Riley Reef might, but he's got a strong history of production where the next three games are probably not going to like impact him. I think the same is probably true for Anthony Harris. I think for the, the one of the biggest players that this is going to impact is probably Afadi Adenabo, um, because he's turned it around a little bit over the past couple of games. Obviously this game, he didn't get much pressure. No one did. Um, but he is Vikings free agent. So if he's got eight pressures from the previous game, and then the next three games, he continues to produce pressure, um, at a somewhat high level, you know, he's got the ability to kind of turn that around and turn that into money. Cause I think, uh, he's going to be a free agent next year, right? So the 2021 free agents, um, yeah, he is a uh, restricted free agent. So the Vikings have to place like a first round tender on him. Um, so there's that, uh, I would say Jaleel Johnson has played poorly enough that it's not going to help him, help him. Same with Dakota Dozier. I think Brett Jones, maybe if the Vikings just seem that Dakota Dozier is just not cutting it, which like he's not. Playing Brett Jones, who is in a contract year, this could be huge for him. That'd be huge uh, in terms of his ability to generate a contract. I think for Eric Wilson, that's true as well. If you can um, stop the run, you know he's hitting a contract year at age twenty-seven for next year. Um, that's going to be big. And then just in terms of like whether or not they get to make a roster, like Chris Jones, right? Like I, he's not particularly good or exciting, but if he plays like well enough over the next three games, he's probably better than a typical you know sixth cornerback, and so he might be able. Um, to kind of make the roster as well. Um, beyond that, I would say, I don't know, like if, if uh, Alexander Madison continues to be a hurt, which I don't expect, um, maybe Michael Boone, maybe Hercules Mata'afa, if, if he generates pressure and generates some sacks over the next couple of games, it might discourage the Vikings from seeking out um, a, uh, a depth slash developmental edge defender to compete with him and Wanham next year. So that could be big. Um, Todd Davis is going to want to have to make the roster next year. I don't know if that's in the cards for him right now with how he's playing. Um, so those are the players where, that, where I think it's big for them. Where I think, for like example, Cameron Dance or Jeff Gladney have done enough that if they kind of the bottom falls out for them over the next three games, you can just say they hit a rookie wall or something. Like I don't think that that would um, really alter anybody's trajectory with the way that they're evaluating that unit. But for like Todd Davis or Herky is Alpha, I think that it would. I think that. Um, having the ability to kind of use this opportunity would be big. Same if Kyle Rudolph is injured and continues to be injured, which again, I don't expect. He almost played in this game. But if Tyler Conklin continues to get more opportunities and play like he did um, this last week, that would be big too. So 
I didn't nail down like the top three. This will be big for them, but I think those are some good names to consider as well as uh, KJ Osborne um, and maybe Chad Beebe because if if he keeps dropping passes, which I think this is his first regular season drop was this week, but um, a lot in the preseason, a lot in camp, and then also the muffed punts. Um, if he keeps doing that, I just don't see how, even though the Vikings seem to love him so much, I don't see how he makes the roster next year. Um, same with KJ Osborne. If he it looks like a good return in the final three games that might convince the Vikings to not cut him out. Right. If he keeps on getting targeted on kick returns, the way he's, he's been just getting just killed out there and more often than not, not getting the call on it. I could, I could see him going. I, I see like him going, no, I, I'm out. <laughs> this is, this is the sound of me retiring and no one being like, no, you should stay. <laughs> right. Yeah, exactly. Like, that was that was a particularly rough shot that uh, that he had. Uh, Ricardo says, "Greetings, sirs. I thought I would ask this question as a way to distract my brain from whatever that was yesterday." Referring to the game, obviously. As context for my question, I do not use Twitter for a variety of reasons, but because I, uh, but mostly because I don't have the time. That being said, I figured I would direct my query to an expert and James, Jesus. Uh, excluding people who have a professional or public need to use the platform to disperse information. Journalists, content creators, municipalities, etc. Do all of the people on Twitter suck? It seems like that way to me. But as I stated, I am not an objective judge. If they do all not suck, what percentage would you put it at? So there's and there's while a, I'm oh yeah okay, oh, yeah get, go as I say and while I'm leveraging uh, people's exper- expertise so that no one feels left out, I have one more, James. Uh, for a living space approximately 40 to 50 square feet with an 8-foot ceiling, would you recommend I go with a three-way lamp, a dimmer, or none of the above? I would go with a three-way lamp and just a couple of nice bulbs with that, but I'm just going uh, to say that and just not refer to anything else. Oh, yeah, okay, yeah. I don't know why we'd want to ask James about lamps, but sure. Exactly. Fine. No reason to ask me about lamps at all. Um. Most people on Twitter. Okay, so the this Twitter question. So most people on Twitter don't tweet; they just follow. Um, so that's fine. That I I, I would prefer that because I've got um, thirty thousand followers. If they all tweeted at me, I would die. Um, that's that's too much engagement. But um, yeah. So so most people on Twitter don't suck because they don't do anything. They use Twitter to receive information, not send information. Maybe they'll DM some people. Maybe they'll only talk to a couple of their friends via Twitter or something like that, but they'll usually probably just text them or something, right? So most people on Twitter don't suck. Now, the people who tweet, most of the interactions I have on Twitter are fine, good, wholesome. Maybe somebody wants some information. They're like, hey, I don't know about this. What can you say? And I usually just respond, right? Um, it's really, I, I just happen to fill people's feeds with toxic people because that's who I'm fighting with, and I can't stop. I have a problem. Um, so I create a sampling error for the people who suck by promoting the people who suck, um, which is not to say that I should start promoting the people who don't suck because it, in a lot of instances it doesn't make sense. If I'm like just answering like a technical question, like, hey, I, I missed it. Did the Vikings do this or whatever? It doesn't make a ton of sense to quote tweet them and be like, oh, yeah, no, this is what happened. It just fills up the timeline with a bunch of fluff. Um, so most of the people that are fine to interact with, it doesn't make sense to promote uh, and, and use their tweet and a quote tweet and a response. Um, but a lot of the people that I do interact with where it does make sense, I'm arguing with them, right? And... Uh, that that makes it seem like the more interaction that you have, the worse it is, which is true, but not in the way that you think. Um, I, I don't think most interactions on Twitter suck. Plus, uh, the people I follow that interact with me are all really great. A lot of them are professionals, like you said, um, but a lot of them aren't, right? Uh, and so um, I've made a bunch of friends on Twitter. Some of them no longer um, are, you know, produce football content or anything like that. They're just like people, and I'm still friends with them. Uh, and so, yeah, most people on Twitter don't suck. It's just the people that you see the most often that are not using Twitter in a professional capacity, um, are, you, you're probably seeing them a lot for a reason. Uh, and, and for me, that reason happens to be, uh, I've put them on your feed because I'm a toxic person to follow. I'm sorry. 
Well, I suppose the first thing to do is to, you know, the first thing is admitting you're part of the problem. Uh, yeah, I'm not going to so. do anything about it. But yeah, if there's a set of steps here to follow, I've taken step one and then I've just like stopped. Yeah. Well, <laughs> oh, we'll I the see. Rest of I'm those. part of the problem. Oh, good to know. Yeah, exactly. You're not going to start atoning for your sins or anything. Don from Ohio says, I easily destroyed Eric Thompson at Fantasy Football. Is it fair to say this is the equivalent of NDSU uh, if they had played the Ohio State University? How much did you beat him by? Because if you beat him by like 20, uh, that wouldn't be enough. The uh, the screenshot was pretty impressive, though I can't remember what the score was. It was pretty impressive. Uh, also from Don from Ohio, he has a final question for us. He says, hey guys, I have another legal question for you. Oh my God. My cousin opened a snack shop inside a large skyscraper in Los Angeles owned by a very rich Japanese man. During their annual holiday party, a large group of Germans who were not invited to said party got into it with some type of cowboy from New York City. <laughs> One thing led to another and things got carried away between all of them. In the ensuing melee, my cousin's snack shop uh, sustained significant <laughs> water and fire damage from these hooligans. Uh, unfortunately for my cousin, he didn't have enough money to insure his snack shop. Who should he sue here? The owner of the skyscraper for allowing the melee to escalate? The uninvited Germans? The cowboy cop from New York City? The terrible security company? Well, I would say in this completely hypothetical scenario, and it just sucks that this occurred during the holidays, um, you, pro you probably can't think of this scenario outside of the holidays, honestly, because when else would it occur? It is certainly a holiday scenario. Um, the, uh, I think here you would talk to a lawyer, and the lawyer, if they were particularly litigious, would say probably all of them. But the question for who is actually liable and, and which suits will be successful, I obviously don't know. I'm not a lawyer. I don't know why we've answered multiple legal questions on the show. I don't even claim to know the law. Um, but it probably depends on the municipality you're in. It sounds like you're not in New York City. Uh, I guess uh, I guess it is the 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 skyscraper is in L.A. Um, it probably de it probably depends on the tenant agreement that you signed. With, uh, with uh, the owner of the building, either the original owner before uh, this new owner bought the building or with the new owner, but whatever that tenant agreement is, um, whether or not um, the implication that they have security implies certain obligations on their part, um, I would think that it is likely that they are probably liable to provide base level security and then they would pursue damages from the security company, not you. But... In a scenario where it's not reasonable for a security company to take on, you know, uh, this you say here a large group of Germans that were uninvited. If um, if the group was like committed enough and and perhaps uh, armed or something like something a, a typical security company would not be able to handle, um, I, I would imagine that that group becomes liable then too, and it's out of the hands of the security company and into the hands of whoever is committing. Um, what, what seems to be an act of at least trespassing, if not more. Um, the cowboy cop from New York City, uh, I don't know, maybe maybe cowboy cop insurance covers it. I don't know if he was acting off-duty or on-duty, but if he's acting off-duty, um, he might be liable as well. Um, again, not a lawyer, but I would imagine it depends on the tenant agreement. It depends on how illegal the action was from this uninvited group of Germans, whether or not they were doing more than trespassing. Uh, and it depends on whether or not it was reasonable within the parameters of the agreement that the security company made with the uh, um, the original uh, owner of the building. You know, it, your your best bet here is po is probably to go class action. Quite frankly, because I wonder if you know what who else. Oh yeah, form a tenants unit. Uh, uh, honestly, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's entirely possible something as silly as like an air duct ended up getting you know, partially destroyed through it too. So there, there's plenty of options for you as far as uh, how your friend should, uh, should, should try to figure out what to do. Yeah. I thought, I think, uh, I think trying to, to get, uh, to, to get together for that is probably the best option. Uh, that is going to be it for this episode of Norse code. Uh, reef, what do you have to plug? Um, not a ton. I'm going to do the players of the week, obviously, and then a mailbag this week, and then uh, who do the Vikings play next week? I already forgot. Chicago. I might do a preview on that. 
I say they play a team. Yeah, <laughs> one of the three teams they've got on the schedule. Pick one. That's who they play. Yeah, well, it's, it uh, could be the Saints. Trubisky's <laughs> Trubisky. Well, it's not Christmas yet. <laughs> um, it's it's Christmas for your takes though, because it will be Trubisky. Yeah. Oh my God. And people were talking about how good Trubisky's game was, and it was like, well, he didn't throw it beyond ten yards successfully. So, good job. I guess Chase Daniel yep, didn't the, have to do that to beat the Vikings either, but still. Well, that's kind of beside the point. Yeah. Uh, that is going to be it for this episode of North Code. Hope you guys enjoyed it. We'll be back later this week to preview said Bears game. So go ahead and tune in. We'll be happy to uh, no, we'll be happy to talk to you. Uh, happy to preview what could be an interesting. I, I don't want to say trap game because everything is a trap game right now. There, there there's no such thing. <laughs> the only thing that's not a trap game is the Saints game, and it would be a trap for them. So everything's... Everything's a trap. Everything, the Bucks game was a yeah, trap it, game. <laughs> this whole season. It's a trap season. a trap season. Yeah. Yeah, just, just misery. So, uh, for Arif, my name is James. Thank you guys so much for listening, and please remember that all things are possible, in tr- including this trap season, through the power of Ben DiNucci. Do you know if he kicks? <laughs> can, we, can we look that up? I hope he's got, it's like, just, a sidewinder wind-up for the kick. Oh, yeah. Just... Just, just one of a kind, just, just an absolute JMU legend. Uh, so again, through the power of Ben Danucci, and we will be back later this week. Norse Code is the largest and only division of Norse Code LLC. You can find Norse Code on the Daily Norseman, SB Nation's official Vikings blog, at dailynorseman.com. You can also find it on iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, Stitcher, or wherever fine podcasts are aggregated. Our Vikings blogger extraordinaire and generally useful human is Arif Hassan, and he can be found on Twitter at Arif Hassan NFL. You can also find his written work at theathletic.com. I am your podcast host and producer, and my name is James Pagoshnik. You can find me at the show's official Twitter feed at NorseCodeDN or my personal account at BigMono. If you'd like to donate a few bucks to the show, you can make your one-time donation at paypal.me slash norsecode, or you can make a recurring monthly contribution by visiting patreon.com slash norsecode. A donation of $3.50 per month does get you bonus material from the show and much more. Any questions or comments that won't fit in a tweet can be sent to norsecodepodcast at gmail.com. On behalf of the Norse Code staff, we thank you so much for listening. Our formula is this. We go out, we hit people in the mouth. <laughs> <laughs>